Hey everybody, welcome to the second Scandet Indoor Scene Understanding Workshop at CVPR 2020. So this workshop is focused on encouraging and discussing cutting edge research towards 3D semantic scene understanding tasks. And these are becoming more and more important today in both research and industrial applications like augmented and virtual reality, architectural and interior design, um, and autonomous robotics. So these all need a 3D understanding of the environment, including the object semantics and their configurations. So this workshop is organized by myself, I'm Angela, as well as Angel and Manolis from Simon Fraser University and Matthias from the Technical University of Munich. We're focusing on the ScanNet dataset, which has over 1,500 RGBD scans of various indoor environments, and it's used worldwide by thousands of researchers to develop and benchmark state-of-the-art approaches in semantic scene understanding. So we propose to benchmark five tasks that cover this space. Uh, we have 3D semantic label prediction, which is the task where we want to predict the object category labels from the 3D representation. We have a 3D semantic instance prediction, where we want to be able to predict both the object instances as well as the category labels from the 3D representation. We have 2D semantic label prediction, where we are predicting the category labels uh, in the 2D images and 2D semantic instance prediction, similarly predicting the object instances and their category labels from the 2D images. And finally, scene type classification by classifying the entire 3D room into a scene type. So for all these tasks, we are benchmarking on a hidden test set for a fair evaluation. And you can check out the, the leaderboard here and um, of course, participate yourselves. So, Today, in this workshop, we're going to have some great invited speakers, as well as short talks from leading methods on the ScanNet benchmark. So we'll start with Andreas Geiger, who will speak about implicit neural representations for 3D. And then we'll hear from the leaders of the 3D semantic segmentation and 3D semantic instance segmentation tasks about their various approaches. And then we'll have Yasu Furukawa on indoor scene understanding at CBPR. And finally, Tom Funkhauser on 3D semantic scene reconstruction. So we'll be streaming on Zoom and YouTube. So please feel free to ask questions in the chat on both. And we'll collect the questions to be discussed at the end of the workshop. All right, let's get started. Our first talk is from Andreas Geiger, who's a professor at the University of Tübingen and the MPI for Intelligent Systems, where he leads the Autonomous Vision Group. So he's done some really amazing work on 3D understanding from pioneering Kitty to new methods and representations for generative 3D tasks. And he'll be speaking today about implicit neural representations from objects to 3D scenes. So feel free to ask questions on Zoom and YouTube, and we'll collect them to discuss at the end of the workshop. Thank you very much for having me here at this workshop and welcome everyone to my presentation on implicit neural representations, in particular, how we can move from object representations to 3D scene representations. And this is joint work with a number of collaborators, both at ETH Zurich and at uh, Intel and University and Max Planck Tübingen. Traditionally, 3D, 3D reconstruction using deep learning has been approached using discrete output representations, such as voxels, point clouds, or meshes. However, each of these representations comes with certain disadvantages that stem from their discrete nature. Voxel-based representations do not scale to very large resolutions. Point-based representations lose topology, and mesh-based representations are difficult to infer of via neural networks and therefore require either a template mesh that needs to be deformed or lead to non-watertight reconstructions. In our work at CVPR 2019, we've proposed an alternative representation called occupancy networks, where instead of representing the output explicitly, 
we represent the output, the surface, implicitly as the decision boundary of a neural network classifier that distinguishes insides from outside points. However, this representation, despite being able to produce smooth outputs and handle complex topology, has certain limitations that stem from the structure of the implicit neural representations. The way that this representation works is that there is an input um, x that is encoded using um, a uh, feature representation. And then there is a 3D location, a 3D point, that's also fed into this network. And this network is typically a simple fully connected network, such as a residual network, or multiple blocks of a residual network, that then outputs for this particular 3D location, and given this input image x, a probability of occupancy for that particular 3D location. Now, the problem with this is that we have a global latent code here that doesn't capture local information in the input and therefore leads to overly smooth geometry, as you can also see here. Furthermore, the uh, function class of possible shapes is limited fundamentally through the architecture of the neural network. Here we use a simple fully connected, a vanilla fully connected neural network that doesn't, for instance, exploit translation equivariance properties that are present in many input domains. And this results in the fact that implicit models work well for simple objects, but poorly on complex scenes. If we apply the occupancy network from before that worked very well on an individual bench. Now to this scene here, in this case, the input is a sparse, noisy point cloud of this scene. This is the ground truth that we see here. Then the output looks something like this. So the network is really not able to capture the details of the scene precisely. The question we were asking now is, well, how can we actually reconstruct larger scenes using these implicit neural representations that seem so promising, but are fundamentally limited to these object-based representations? And that led us to the idea of convolutional occupancy networks. In convolutional occupancy networks, the idea is to combine the advantages of convolutions with implicit representations. Here's a very simple form of our convolutional occupancy networks, I will show you multiple variants. Given a sparse and noisy point cloud of the input shape, we use a point net encoder um, per column on a 2D feature plane. So we discretize now the um, domain, let's say the, the ground in terms of a 2D feature plane and encode the features for a particular pixel on that plane by all the points, by a representation that's derived from all the points that are within that red cuboid here using a point net encoding. Now we have local information on that 2D feature plane. And then we use a 2D unit to aggregate information on that 2D feature plane, which integrates this equivariant um, inductive bias into the model. After the 2D unit, we can then query the features at every 3D point using bilinear interpolation in this 2D canonical feature plane. So if we want to query the features of this point, we project it um, to the feature plane, and then we do a bilinear interpolation of the features that are the output of the 2D unit. So these adjacent um, pixels here. Now we have more rich local features, which means that we need a more shallow network, a more shallow occupancy network only, that has the same function as before. It takes as input a 3D location and the features and produces an occupancy probability. We can also do this for multiple canonical planes. We can use um, free canonical planes, for instance, have three different units that operate on these three planes, and we then simply concatenate the features from all these three planes. 
We can also use a volumetric representation. Instead of projecting onto feature planes, we can just project into volumetric space. So we have a local point net that aggregates information now within this red box here. And then we have a 3D unit that operates on this coarse 3D representation, gives us features in that coarse 3D representation. And then we have a readout unit in the form of an occupancy network that now queries the adjacent voxels using trilinear interpolation in order to obtain features for a particular location, and then combines this with the 3D location in order to derive using this fully connected network and occupancy probability. So here's a direct comparison of the two methods. On the top, we can see the traditional occupancy network. On the bottom, we can see the convolutional variant, where now the features are not a global code anymore, but they are distributed in 3D space, and they can benefit from the equivalent properties of convolutional networks, either in 2D or 3D space. So how does this work? Let's look at some results. So here we first looked at, uh, we, first, we first wondered if we can also improve the quality of object level reconstructions. And it turns out that this is the case, in particular for complex object shapes. So here we can see the input on the left, we can either work with a coarse voxelization of the object that we want to refine, or we can take a point cloud as input. Just means we need to use different encodings here. Then we see the original occupancy network results here in the second column, which loses quite some details. And then we have the results of our convolutional occupancy network here in the third column, which retains much more details of this lamp here, for instance or of this desk here. On the right, we see the ground truth. We also observed that using convolutional occupancy networks yields to faster training compared to standard occupancy networks, as we can see here from this plot. Here on the top, we can see the um, 3D variant and the free plane 2D variant of our convolutional occupancy networks versus the traditional occupancy network here in blue. So not only achieve, do we achieve higher validation IOU, but we also um, converge faster to this higher IOU. Now let's look at how well this model now works for what we wanted to do, scene level reconstruction. The input here is a point cloud of a synthetic room scene. So we build a little generative model to produce synthetic rooms based on combining objects from the ShapeNet database. And we can see on the right the ground truth and the reconstructions of occupancy network, Poisson surface reconstruction as a baseline, and our model. As you can see, occupancy network produces smooth results but fails in recovering the details. Poisson surface reconstruction leads to very noisy results. And our method leads to nice and smooth reconstructions. Now, this was trained and evaluated on synthetic rooms from the same distribution. But we can also take this model trained on synthetic rooms and evaluate it on the scanner data set. And this is what we did here. And it actually turns out that it generalizes quite well from synthetic to real data, at least using point clouds as input. So here we have a input point cloud from the scanner data set. And then we see the result of occupancy network, Poisson surface reconstruction and our reconstructions. We also tested it on much larger scenes. Because we have a convolutional model, a fully convolutional model, we can scale this to scenes as large as the Matterport dataset. We train it on synthetic crops, and then we evaluate on this large scene using sliding windows. Now, this model using the sliding window approach scales to any scene because we can load sliding windows into memory as we desire, and then erase them from memory once we have them processed and stitch the results together, as long as the receptive field doesn't grow too big. But we typically operate with receptive field sizes of a room size, which still um, works well with the discretization that we choose for the 3D representation. So the key insights here are, well, Convolutional models allow for scaling implicit models to larger scenes, which is great. So we can even tackle scenes as large as the Matterport dataset. Convolutional models also train faster compared to fully implicit models. 
and they allow for incorporating local feature information. For objects, we found that the 3D, uh, free plane model has the best accuracy memory trade-off. But for larger scenes, we found the volumetric representation to work best. And we also found that the models, at least using point clouds as input, transfer actually quite well from synthetic to real scenes. Now, all of the results that presented so far were um, targeted towards highly accurate geometry. But what about appearance? And in particular, what about realistic appearance? Appearance that changes with respect to the viewpoint of the observer. I want to briefly present now some very recent work that we did on um, representing surface light fields using implicit representations. The problem is defined as follows. Given the 3D geometry that's ever derived using an implicit method or another method, and a real image of that object as an input to a neural network, we want to infer for a particular viewpoint or light location what the object would look like. So here, this is a real result of our method where we take this image as input and this geometry as input. And then we can manipulate the light source such that you can see the object is differently lit, the shadows look differently, or we can manipulate the viewpoint which uh, with a fixed light source, which also changes the shadows and the shading of the object. Existing representations can't do this. So for instance, the texture field approach that we presented um, last year is not able to um, recover view-dependent appearance information. While this is uh, leading to 3D consistent results, it basically just represents texture. It's a mapping from a 3D point to a color value. So it's not viewpoint independent and it cannot model lighting. The idea behind our conditional surface light fields now is to also condition this neural network on the viewpoint and the light location. Here on the top, we see the traditional rendering equation that's used in computer graphics, where the illumination is computed as the integral over some um, BRDF representation, some reflection model, times the light source. And it's also a quantity of the normal and uh, the incoming rays that are integrated over here. Now, what we want to do with a conditional surface light field approach is we want to get rid of the normals, so we don't we model the surface light field only conditioned on a particular object, which means that we model this inner term here um, using a neural network that depends on the 3D point location P, the viewpoint direction V, and the lighting direction L. And then at test time, we can use the rendering equation and use our model inside that rendering equation to generate images for arbitrary light sources or environment maps by integrating over the environment map, for instance. Here on the bottom, you can see a graphical representation of what our network does. It takes the 3D point, the view direction, and the light setting as input and produces a color vector as output. So let's look at some examples. So the first result that we um, performed the first experiment that we performed was overfitting to a single object. So the input here is the shape of a single object. And we minimize the reconstruction loss between a target image. We use a uh, photorealistic database with materials here. There's actually not that many databases, unfortunately, that can be used, but there is one for chairs. Um, and try to minimize the reconstruction error here. And the model takes like now this input shape and queries the input shape using its depth map at every 3D location. And we have split the model into two parts. There's an appearance field that first calculates an appearance vector from this information. And then there's a lighting model that takes in addition the light setting and the view direction and can now from this appearance code predict for this particular pixel the color under this light condition and view direction. So how does this work? Let's look at some results. First, we performed a shadow analysis where we were changing the light location. On the right, you can see the ground truth. On the left, you can see the results produced by our approach. 
Note that this requires for every pixel to execute the rendering equation only a single time because we use a point light source. As you can see, the shadows are learned relatively accurately with a few details uh, missing. We also performed a reflection analysis where we now change the viewpoint. In this case, we use a more complex environment map that's uh, looking like this here to illustrate how our results, um, how our method can produce viewpoint varying um, appearance based on this environment map. And of course, in this case, we need to execute the rendering operator or the surface light field. We need to query the surface light field multiple times during the execution of the rendering operator because we have not just a single point light source, but multiple. Here on the right, you can see how smooth the result looks like if we now apply this and rotate the object. This is basically just demonstrating how powerful the representation is and what it can actually learn. It's not conditioned on an image yet. And here is a different environment map where you can see clouds mirroring in the surface of the vehicle. The next experiment we did is uh, on single image appearance prediction, where now we condition additionally on a uh, an input image using an image encoder or producing a latent code. So now we have a model that's trained such that it can take an additional RGB image and from that infer the surface light field. So here are some results. First, we look at some results with the ground roof geometry. You can see the input image on the left the image-to-image -image translation results on the right. This is a pure 2D method. And this is what happens if you change the light location. And these are our results. And this is what happens if you change the light location. It also works with inferred geometry. Here on the left, we can see the input. On the right, the geometry inferred using an occupancy network and the surface light field that has been estimated for this input image. Note that only a single input image is given to the approach. And it also works with real input images. So this is the scene that we've seen in the beginning. And finally, we can also use our model as a generative model. In this case, we're using a variational autoencoder-like setting where we take the target image, encode it using an encoder, and then decode it again using our model. And then we can, of course, sample new um, appearances from our model. And here are some results for latent appearance space interpolation. So you can see the light location is fixed, but the appearance changes. So this is all fine, but as I already mentioned, uh, there is a problem. There is not enough data sets to train such models. They require huge amounts of training data, different viewpoints from objects where the objects have realistic material properties. So one project that I want to quickly present that we also conduct in our lab is Toward going towards more realistic data sets. In this paper on joint estimation of post geometry and spatially varying BRDF, we do a first step towards this setup. The goal is a data set of 3D indoor scenes that is captured with high accuracy from a handheld mobile sensor. For this, we build a custom sensor rig using a depth sensor similar to the Microsoft Kinect and active illumination plus an RGB camera for material estimation. Here you can see the light cerns that can be turned on and off using an Arduino device. And then we take this handheld device and go around and scan objects. And ultimately, we like to scan entire rooms and buildings with that. We formulated an approach where both materials and geometry are estimated jointly. If we um, want to estimate accurate geometry, we require to know the appearance properties precisely. But vice versa, if we know um, 
uh, if we want to estimate the appearance, we want to we need to know the geometry precisely. That's why we we try to formulate both tasks jointly, where we just provide a rough initialization for both and can come up with a precise inference result of all quantities. The contributions of this work that we also present at CVPR here is a joint formulation over pose, geometry, and spatially varying BRDF using a single objective function minimized using off-the-shelf gradient-based solvers, which is in contrast to prior work, which often uses an alternating optimization scheme of multiple different objective functions. We obtain a meaningful segmentation into different um, parts in terms of their material and accurate geometric details. Here we can see some results on the left for relighting and on the right for novel viewpoint estimation. We found that joint opt optimization of geometry and material and pose helps to improve the results. But this is only a first step. Object level reconstruction remains challenging, in particular with a limited number of observations. Note that we just have this mobile sensor that we move through the scene, which produces a much sparser light field compared to a, a gantry rig, for instance. So the goal is now to scale this to larger scenes and also to scenes where we have external illumination. Here in this case, we're assuming that there is only the light source active and all other lights are turned off. Another uh, data set that I want to quickly present to you that we are working on at the moment is a, is a new version of the Kitty data set. A new version of the Kitty data set that has a 360 degree viewpoint and also semantic labels for all parts of it. It's actually a data set that we have been working on since 2016 already, but we uh, will be releasing that data set only this summer. Uh, due to various issues in in actually finalizing the data set. As you can imagine, the last 10% always take the majority of the time, so that's why it took us long. The data set is composed of many different driving scenes. Um, here you can see the training scenes for this data set, and it has, as you can see, semantic information attached to each 3D point. It features, in addition to the front-facing stereo cameras from the Kitty data set, also 360-degree fisheye cameras. And in addition to the Velodyne laser scanner, a SIG Pushbroom laser scanner and a GPS localization system. We have recorded about 73 kilometers of driving um, that yields four times 83,000 frames in total. All frames are accurately geolocalized, which allows for exploiting information such as OpenStreetMap, for instance. And we, we are um, labeled using accurate semantic labels they're consistent with cityscapes, and we use 19 classes for the evaluation that we plan. Each instance is assigned with a consistent instance ID across all frames. So unlike other data sets where images are labeled individually, what we did here is we labeled images um, based on the 3D information. So here's an illustration of the sensors of the data set. You can see the left and the right forward-facing camera and the fisheye cameras. And here you can see the um, 3D point clouds produced by the Velodyne laser scanner, the SIG laser scanner, and the stereo system. Here you can see a reconstruction of one particular scene. And on the right, you can see that we labeled not only the cars, as we did in the Kitty data set, but we also labeled the road, the sidewalk, and the buildings and the vegetation using bounding boxes. Using an inference algorithm that does joint inference in 3D and 2D space, we then obtain labels, semantic labels, um, both for the point clouds as well as for each pixel in the image. And all instance labels are consistent across time. We hope that this data set will become valuable for research in various domains, including multimodal estimation, trajectory prediction, novel view synthesis, um, reconstruction, simulation, and more. With that, I want to thank you for your attention. I will also thank you, my sponsors, for supporting our research. And I want to point you to this website here, which is our blog, if you're interested in our research, to find out more. Thanks.
Um, thanks, Andres, for the, the great talk. Uh, we can take a few, few questions now. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of interesting stuff being presented. I see one in uh, YouTube. Uh -huh. um, oh, the question is about like how to process the Matterport scan in a single forward pass. Yeah, that's not uh, what's happening. So for like what we do for the Matterport data set is basically the input is a like in general for this type of experiments, the input is a, is a noisy point cloud and the uh, output is the um, uh, is the, the, the occupancy prediction. Um, that means that if you do like inference at the level of multiple rooms, like at the Metaphor scale, the receptive field size doesn't need to capture the entire um, Metaphor data set. There's not any additional use for information in there. It, it is sufficient if the receptive field size is at the room level. So what we do then is basically a training time. We chunk up the uh, into random pieces, the scene um, during training. Uh, and train this in, in patches. And at inference time, we run it in a sliding window, which means that we have overlapping receptive fields, but we have um, just um, like the output is, is, is uh, just a regular grid. So we have, let's say maybe um, a 30 by 30, uh, uh, by 30 output grid, but the input is a, is a larger receptive field that overlaps. Basically, right. So, and then you get reconstructions that are seamless um, because it doesn't like it's, it's like a regular convolution, basically. Which in a fully convolutional network, if you have a two D convolutional network that has a receptive field that it's not the entire image size, right? Then you can also apply it uh, in chunks, um, and you you don't need the full memory. Yeah, I hope that answers that. Um, there's no question. Um, one question for the VAE encoder. Why can you guarantee model target image always guarantee normal distribution output to latent vector? OK, I don't understand this question. <laughs> oh, why can you change this model target image always guarantee normal distribution output? So this is a, I mean, it would be easier probably if you speak up here in, are you in the Zoom room? Um, I, I need to quickly, so, so which slide are you referring to? <laughs> You're talking about which project? You're talking about the, the texture field project, I assume, the, the um, surface light field project, I assume, right? It would be easier probably if you just speak. I mean, it's, it's, it's basically a standard VAE. Um, and if you wanna go, oh, you don't have the slides, right? Okay, I can, should I share? Um, let me see, I'll share my screen. Share, okay, hope you can see. Um, so you, oh. so this VAE encoder um, encodes, this is, a, this is a standard VAE model. I mean, there's nothing very different from a, like the VAE model just takes the input and codes it into latent vector, basically into the distribution mu and, and sigma. And then uh, the latent vector is sampled and then using the reparameterization trick and then the um, appearance field and the lighting model are the decoder that predict the image that's then compared using a reconstruction loss. Some a pretty standard VAE version of this model. I mean, in addition, the VAE takes S as an input because it's it's useful for the encoder to be informed about uh, the shape. So then it doesn't have to do this inference task of inferring the shape also from the target image, which is a more difficult task. I just had a question in the chat. Um, how how resilient is the conf uh, occupancy network towards scale variance of objects? Um, 
So tabletop objects versus room scale objects. Uh -huh. um, so one thing that we did is we, one problem with these occupancy networks is that you need watertight meshes. And so if you wanna apply them on ScanNet, it's difficult. It's anyways, it's pretty difficult for walls because walls don't really have a size, right? So um, walls are kind of undefined in particular if you don't see them from both sides. So what, what we did for this is basically we, we created synthetic data where the walls had a small thickness, like you know, a few centimeters, uh, which the network could still predict. Um, and then we trained on synthetic data and tested on real data. And because in the scanner data set, the, um, no, in the ShapeNet data set, the objects don't, do not all have a, a proper size. We set the size manually based on some distribution. And in the beginning, we did experiments where we set the size like in very, like very wildly, basically, like very tiny chairs, big chairs. And the model then um, still was working reasonably well on the scanner data set. So that basically implies that using this convolutional backbone, the model learns pretty local shape features for this problem of noisy point cloud to shape uh, inference. Um, and they generalize reasonably well. But of course, if you have a different task where you, ha where you have to rely on stronger prior knowledge, um, then this will probably, you know, um, like incorporate also stronger biases with respect to size. In general, in the end, we try to, of course, scale the, um, the scene size to the scene that we actually expect, yeah. But it, 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 I mean, the generalization is not only across the size. It, it generalizes, yeah, I can train on chairs and you, you test on tables or on animals and it still, it still does a reasonable job. Okay, thank you. I mean, that's the main point to learn a more localized representation, basically, yeah. Um, Hi, um, I have one question. Um, how scalable is this uh, light estimation model to uh, indoor scene environments? The like this um, uh, conditional surface light fields to indoor see like to scenes. Yeah, we we haven't tested on scenes. So one problem with this model is um, that it's really difficult to find good data sets for it because the data set requires uh, images. Well, you could have images and depth like um, RGBD images. That's not a problem, but it requires images of scenes. I mean, in its current form, at least of scenes that are lit by a point light source where you know the location of. And so there's not that many data sets like that. So we use this data set, which has photorealistic chairs, so we can render it in any, um, in any, uh, for any object and any material and any light uh, and viewpoint location. But ideally we of course like to work with real data and that's a, that's a limitation so far that we need to apply. I mean, we need to get the data for, for training this on real data. So we can't, I can't really say how well it works on scenes because we, uh, I, I don't have like, it's a conditional model, right? It re requires a lot of data in order to make conditional inferences from uh, just a single image and so, there's, to my knowledge, not a good data set that has a lot of, you know, realistic material properties that, where this model would actually be helpful compared to, if you do it on the scan, scan net, for instance, then you don't need this, right? You, you, you don't have um, the, you don't need to do the light inference because the textures are just textures and there's no materials. Understood, thank you. Thanks. Uh, hi, uh, Professor. Uh, and just uh, so one, uh, I want the the one who asked uh, about VIE encoder uh, question. Uh, why can we always assume like an uh, input if uh, if it's not normal distribution and the outputs should uh, should shouldn't have like a, a latent latent vector with normal distribution? Uh, why in VIE encoder we uh, we always assume the input is a normal distribution? Uh, uh, I mean, in a real case, there should be lots of random noise. Uh, which like uh, make the input uh, in maybe some points and uh, distribution or some, something else. Why can we always assume uh, BIE encoder can uh, extend to uh, all the cases? Yeah. I mean, this is the assumption of the VIE model, right? It has, I mean, it's just a standard VIE model. It's just um, uh, the assumption is that it, it can actually uh, um, uh, basically like it predicts the parameters of a normal distribution. That's also a major limitation of the VIE model. I mean, that's one of the reasons why, I mean, the encoder is one of the reasons why 
um, the VIE models in practice don't produce as high fidelity results as generative adversarial networks, for instance, right? So, yeah, I mean, it would be easy to also apply this model in a, with an adversarial loss. There's no problem. Here we did it with a VIE um, generative framework. Yeah, that's that's a limitation of that model. I mean, there's there's extensions of this type of model, but they all have their ups and downs. So we stick with the regular VAE model. It's all standard. Uh, got it. So because the all the environment is in simulated, so you assume uh, this uh, uh, assume like uh, always is can generate a normal distribution in your generative model. So, so that's why you use VAE encoder here. It has nothing to do with the observations being from a simulation or not. It could be real observations. I mean, uh, VAEs work with real images as well. They make the same assumptions. <laughs> I mean, this is just a model assumption. Yeah. I think because I, okay. So it won't uh, be, because in the real world, uh, I, I'm just wondering if there's lots of random noise. So, or because of this VOE encoder design, so uh, somehow uh, uh, make the model uh, decay through the time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think we didn't simulate noise here, but it, it doesn't really matter. I mean, this is the input to the VAE encoder. Then you sample from the latent, latent distribution and then you can sample, I mean, we can sample, um, like the predicted images as it's a VAE. Um, so that, that works. Um, and what we show here is then the mean image. Yeah. So Got it. Okay. thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Maybe we can take just one more question. There's there's one in the chat about um, 2D comps and the occupancy network versus 3D comps and the occupancy network. Um, yes. So, like in, in the paper, there are more details on this. Um, let me see. What what is exactly the question? Uh, is this? Oh, this is a different chat. This is not the YouTube chat. Uh, yeah, the, why do you think 2D convolutions <laughs> plus that. occupancy network performs better than 3D plus occupancy network? Is the 3D comp overfitting? Oh, I see, I see the question now. Oh, yeah, I wasn't in this uh, other chat. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I can't really answer that. Um, I, I mean, one, one difference between, like if you have 2D convolutions, because of their nature of being 2D convolutions, you can use uh, higher resolution feature maps. And so um, that gives you more precise estimates. On the other hand, you have the disadvantage of having these auto orthogonal projections, which uh, from which you lose, uh, by which you lose something. Honestly, we were surprised by this. We were actually surprised that, like if you use a single plane, it doesn't work very well. But if you use three different planes, um, you can get surfaces that are quite slanted. So they, they seem to not introduce too much um, bias in terms of the orientation. However, when we went to real scenes, for some reason, the 3D convolutions were slightly better. Um, still, we were quite surprised that with 2D convolutions, you could um, get quite some performance out of these models. Uh, yes, we, we use, uh, we cannot use, we cannot go to the same resolution in 3D because, so there was this a follow up question. We cannot use the same resolution in 3D as for 2D because for 3D the memory grows cubically, right? So then we are limited by, we are using standard 1080 or 2080 uh, TI cards with 12 gigabyte memory. Um, so for 3D, we can go maybe to 32 or 64 cube. And then for 2D, we can go to 128 or 256. Great, thanks. Lots of questions. Um, and, and thanks again for the, the great talk. Uh, so now um, we'd like to introduce one of the, the first uh, talks from one of the leading methods on the ScanNet benchmark. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Hugh Thomas, whose work on uh, KPConf has produced really effective semantic segmentation results on, on point clouds. Oh, thanks. Hi. Um, hope I'm going to share the screen. All right. Um, so thanks everyone for uh, joining and thanks the organizer for inviting me. I'm going to present the work called KPCon, Flexible and Deformable Convolution for Point Clouds. So 
in our work, we focus only on point clouds, uh, no meshes, no image. So uh, one important thing is to remember that the point clouds are uh, 3D coordinates, but also the feature that are associated to the coordinates. Uh, so the point will play kind of a structural element of the data and the feature will carry the information. I'm going to start with a quick state of the art of the related work to point convolution. And obviously, I cannot avoid talking about point nets, so I'm not going to represent the paper. But the main thing that this paper uh, contributed was to show that the multilayer perception uh, applied on self points can be used as a universal approximator of any continuous function of space. And that's a very important result uh, for the rest of the presentation. So now I'm going to talk about point convolution and, of course, uh, starting from image convolution and how it's defined. So the convolution has made what modern computer, computer vision is today. Um, and it's based on a convolution definition, but more than the mathematical definition is the image convolution that we're looking at, which is actually a local filter in image space. So when you look at the definition in the equation, um, well, the first important thing is that we are summing things over a limited domain, a neighborhood, so here in red, um, and we're just basically doing a weighted sum of the input features, uh, and the weights are the kernels um, that we have to define. So if you want to define a point convolution, you, you can use the same formulation, uh, just sum of our neighborhood, uh, and you have to define a function, which is the kernel, that's going to be applying weights to the feature uh, as inputs. So the two important things that you will need to have is a neighborhood and a kernel function. Um, I created a little table uh, of some methods uh, which define point convolution and started them with the neighborhood and the kernel function. So as you can see, the neighborhoods, uh, two main definitions are used, either radius neighborhoods uh, or KNN. Um, and in fact, radius neighborhood has uh, the advantage of being geometrically consistent and has shown a uh, handcrafted feature and that it has better representation of the geometry. So it's kind of a better representation, but kind of more difficult to implement because it has various um, sizes. And then the kernel function uh, has to be defined. And as I said earlier, PointNet introduced this MLP as a universal approximator. And the kernel function is just a function of space. So you can use the MLP to actually encode it. But however, it's not the best choice because you cannot really have a clue about how the network is learning its representation and how the convolution is happening. You kind of uh, avoid the problem of defining convolution by just saying MLP is going to do the trick. So here we focused about other um, definition of the kernel uh, to define a 3D convolution. So the motivation that we didn't find any convolution satisfying yet, and we wanted also to improve the performances of the current methods. Uh, and one big, big thing was uh, to understand the learned representation that our convolution could uh, could get. So we based our work on the intuition about how image convolution work. So if you think of it, um, the kernel in an image is kind of a small image, and the weights are just the pixel value in this kernel. So we can do the same for point cloud and just decide that the kernel will be a, a small point cloud, so a set of points. And we can assign to these points some values which are going to be the weights. However, this does not define um, a filter in the Euclidean space because the weights are only located on points. So we can just use a trick of having an inference function, which is basically a function that decreases with the distance so that each point is going to apply its weight in its own area or neighborhood. So what does it mean in the convolution formula with a more mathematical uh, point of view? Um, so we can take the formula that I just explained a few uh, slides before. The features are the features that, that are worn by the points as input. Uh, the neighborhood that we chose is radius neighborhood for the reason I just explained. And the kernel function G is what we want to define here. So obviously, we choose to use kernel points, as I just said, uh, which we call xk. And each of these points will have a weight, which we call wk. And the value of the function g in any 
position in this sphere is going to be the sum of this WK times an inference function, which is just decreasing with the distance. So it's a really simple formulation um, and it's really easy to implement. Um, but it has a few limitations. So for example, um, it is kind of uh, biased by density. So when you have an input point cloud and we're going to do a KP comp inference, you first have to subsample the input so that the density of points is regularized uh, in this sphere. Then you can apply the convolution sphere. So here it's in 2D for just the visualization. You can apply it to every part of the point cloud and get the result feature uh, in the output point cloud. So here you have some examples of uh, kernel point disposition in 3D. Um, the advantage of this is that we can actually choose the number of points that we use in our kernel, uh, as opposed to voxel network where you are basically stuck with power, power of three. So here we can actually have fewer parameters or more parameters depending on how powerful we want the network to be. And the other good thing about having the points defined in kernel is that we can actually define a deformable extension. So this is just a follow-up work on uh, something that has been defined in the image and we adapt it to the point cloud. Um, so just for a small explanation, this is a rigid convolution. The kernel is the same and is applied to every part of the point cloud and it outputs a feature uh, at this position where it's applied. But instead of a feature, we can actually output some uh, set of values, which are going to be the offsets that are applied to the points, and then perform a second convolution with this new point position. Uh, and therefore, the second convolution will be adapted to the shape of the point cloud so that, so that the output has um, more information than just the one in the sphere. So now we have defined the convolution and to define uh, the whole network, we just have to have a pooling operation, uh, which is basically using the grids of something that I, that I just talked before, just use a larger grid, reduce the number of points. And the feature in the, uh, in the, new, in the new points is just computed uh, with the old points uh, with a max pooling or a KP conf. So here you think of it, the KP conf applied at the position of the new points, but with the old points as input, it's kind of like a stride convolution in image. So the network is defined now, so we can actually uh, experiment and see what the perform what the network is able to perform. Uh, so on object models, uh, we actually have very good results on both uh, shape classification and shape segmentation. But real scene is more uh, important to us because this is the real data that we're looking at and. Uh, we've tried on four different data sets, uh, the method, and without really uh, applying much changes to the definition uh, of the network, we are actually able to perform uh, very well and amongst the best method in a state of the art. Ironically, ScanNet is maybe the data set where we perform uh, the worst, uh, but actually the, the result is still pretty good and that's uh, still very satisfying for us. Uh, here's an example of a result on scanned data sets. Um, this is the prediction of the point cloud, and I can highlight in red um, the errors that the, the network made. And we can see that it's mostly on object boundaries or what I've seen is uh, just occluded, uh, so the object is not complete. And eventually, uh, the important thing that I talked about in the first uh, uh, yeah, a few slides before is to understand the representation that we, we actually have built. Uh, so here we just show the activation of features, a different part of the network. Uh, in the red is high activation and in blue is low activation. So what we see here is that at the first layer of the KPCOM network, we can actually see that we have high activation features for corners, vertical plane, vertical line, or horizontal planes. Um, but if you go deeper in the network, uh, we're going to see much more elaborate picture with like cones, buttresses, stairs, and spheres, uh, which is very interesting to see that the network is able to learn a more complex representation. Uh, this is a short video uh, just to show that the deformable convolution is actually doing what we want it to do. Uh, so that's the deformation that's have been actually done on a scanet scene. Uh, and 
on this small table, the deformation is not very uh, impressive, but on the plane here, you can see that the points are actually focusing on the shape and fitting the, the planar surface. And if you change the surface, uh, for example, on the wall here, uh, you're gonna see that the points are just fitting the, the new plane here. So the convolution is kind of adapting its behavior to the position in the point cloud. So that's a nice uh, result, but actually how, uh, how does it affect uh, the performances? Um, and we can actually show the rigid uh, effective receptive fold to have a proof of what the deformable is able to do. Uh, if you look at the normal KP conf here, uh, the effective field, receptive field in red is uh, all the points of the input point cloud which have an influence on the green point here. So what you see here, all the red points, points are kind of following a Gaussian distribution or something like that. Um, but if you look at the deformable convolution, you see that the um, distribution of the effective receptive fold is much more um, targeted towards the object. So if you look at the bed here, uh, and I go back a little, this was the rigid KP conf, and this is the deformable, which is reaching to get all the bed. Uh, and if you look at the chair, it's instead of uh, getting bigger, it's just shrinking to get focus on the chair. And the last example on, on the, the ground, just so that um, the, the ground plane actually does not carry much information to the, the network, is just um, getting its effective receptive field to go look at objects around to have more information. So that was uh, the, the kind of deformation that we wanna, wanted to see and, uh, and that's really interesting. Uh, so as a conclusion, we defined a new KP convolution, uh, use it in deep networks and get state-of-the-art performance. And we also got useful insights about the network. So our code is uh, open source and we actually have written TensorFlow and PyTorch implementation. So feel free to come and see the GitHub uh, repo to use the code. Um, as an outlook, the KPConf is just a fundamental block, so you can actually use it in any task. Uh, here we just applied it on semantic segmentation that it can be used also with uh, any kind of uh, different point clouds and any kind of task in 3D point clouds. Thank you. Thanks for the nice presentation. Um, we can take a question or two if there's uh, some questions. So I have one um, yep. higher level question. So why do you think it's the that ScanNet is a bit more difficult than some of the, the other data sets in terms of, uh, is that data bias or or is this um, the incompleteness of the scenes or, or something? It's really hard to, uh, to just answer this question because it could come from many, many different factors. Uh, actually, I think the, the fact that the scenes are um, not as complete as in other point clouds makes it harder uh, than for other uh, segmentation tasks uh, where the point clouds are kind of um, really complete uh, and the objects are not a lot occluded. Uh, but it could also come from just the bias in the data. Uh, it depends, yeah. But I assume that the data is obviously harder in ScanNet. Thanks. Any other question? I have a question. Um, so for making the deformation convolution work, um, deformable con convolution, did you have to apply any regularization to make sure that uh, you know the, the offsets are all diverse and they uh, don't yeah. just collapse to a certain location or something? Yeah, in indeed, it's one of the contribution of the paper is that um, in image deformable convolution, uh, the grid, the image grid is full, so you can actually have the pixel move around without any problem. But for point clouds, if you have the, the deformation move somewhere where there are no points at all, uh, then your gradient of this deformation becomes zero. So the point is kind of stuck in the empty space and will never be able to come back uh, to get some information on points. So without any regularization, we actually had network perform very bad because 
the point would just converge to uh, something where all the deformable points would just not be on any points of the input point cloud. Um, and indeed, we actually just used a, a simple distance loss, uh, just a square uh, value of the distance, uh, and minimize that to have this regularization get uh, all the points to fit the input point cloud. Uh, and it's actually combined with a repulsive loss so that uh, in the kernel, each point does not collide to the center and just try to spread uh, in the data. So you have one repulsive loss um, that is applied between each kernel point and one attractive loss, which each kernel point is applied to the closest input point. Great, thank you. Uh, thanks again for the, the nice presentation. Um, so thanks. Next. Next, Fair, whose sparse comp network produced quite a leap in 3D semantic segmentation when it was released. Hello, my name is Ben Graham. I'm a researcher at Facebook AI Research in London. I'll be talking about spatially sparse convolutional networks and applications to the ScanNet dataset. The first application to which convolutional networks were applied was handwriting recognition. Early convolutional networks were typically fairly shallow with large convolutional filters. For example, Jan LeCun's Lunet 5 network had two convolutional layers with convolutional filters of size 5x5. This was applied to the famous MNIST dataset with its digits of size 28 by 28. As you go up through the network, the receptive fields grow very quickly in size, so almost all of the hidden units are being activated by the input. Chinese handwriting recognition is a much more challenging version of the handwriting recognition problem. There are far more character classes and there's much more fine detail to process. In a bid to extend confidence to this setting, Thirasan, Meyer and Schmidhuber developed deeper convolutional networks with larger input fields and much smaller convolutional filters. They achieved an accuracy of 95.77% at the XR 2011 Chinese handwriting competition. Because the convolutional filters are smaller, the receptive fields in these deeper networks grow more slowly. Therefore, a large percentage of the hidden units are not seeing any of the input character. This makes it practical to accelerate the calculations using sparsity and even make the networks bigger. For the 2013 competition, I used spatial sparsity to train a slightly deeper network at double the resolution improving the accuracy to 97.39%. In order to have spatially sparse convolutional networks, you need a concept of active spatial locations, both in the input layer and all the hidden layers. The definition of active locations is inductive. In the input layer, the active locations are places where the input is a non-zero feature vector. For each hidden layer of the network, the input to the layer is the output of the layer below. The spatial locations in a hidden layer are defined to be active if they can see an active spatial location in the input. Here is an example of an input grid with three active spatial locations. We will run a 2x2 two two convolution with stride 1. We have now highlighted the eight overlapping 2x2 two two squares where the convolutional filter can see at least one active input. These eight squares result in eight active locations in the output of this convolutional layer. Each active output location can see at least one, and at most two squared equals four active inputs. If there are no bias terms, then this is mathematically exactly the same as a regular convolutional network. To implement sparse convolutions efficiently requires sparse data structures. A dense convolutional network stores the input and hidden layers as dense tensors of size, length times width times the number of features. In the sparse case, some locations are active, so they have a feature vector. Some locations are not active, so we can save memory by not storing them. We therefore store each active location's feature vector as a row in a matrix. In order to keep track of where the rows in the matrix go in space, we use a hash table. The hash table stores a map from the set of active spatial locations to the number of the corresponding row in the matrix of features. The computation of the convolution also has to be adapted. Some parts of the calculation are more CPU friendly and some are more GPU friendly. For each convolution, there's a hash map storing the locations of the active sites in the input, so a hash map has to be calculated for the output. 
While you're calculating this, you also need to build a list of pairs of input-output locations that can see each other. The offset between the two locations determines which part of the convolutional kernel they use to communicate. I call this the rulebook. Finally, for each entry in the rulebook, the input feature vector is multiplied by a matrix extracted from the convolutional kernel, which is then added to the corresponding output location. This can efficiently be parallelized on the GPU. Downsampling can be performed using either shrouded convolutions or pooling operations which are implemented in a similar way. I first use sparse convolutions in 2D, but sparsity is much more interesting in 3D as 3D space is much bigger. This is sometimes called the curse of dimensionality. Take for example the Eiffel Tower. It fits in a bounding cuboid of size 125 by 125 by 324 meters. Iron weighs 7 metric tons per cubic meter, so you might naively expect the Eiffel Tower to weigh about 37 million tons. It actually only uses 7,300 tons of iron, so it is 0.02% tower and 99.98% empty space. This illustrates the potential efficiency gains of sparse convolutional networks over dense ones. The trend in computer vision has been towards deeper and deeper networks. One of the shared features of the VGG networks, ResNets and DenseNets, is the use of 3 by 3 convolutions with stride 1 and padding 1, so the depth of the network can be increased without changing the spatial resolution. To extend this to the sparse setting, we added a modified convolution operation to the sparse convnet library. We called this a submanifold sparse convolution, as it can operate on lower dimensional objects in a higher dimensional space. An example of a submanifold might be a 1D stroke of a pen on a 2D piece of paper, or the 2D surface of a chair in 3D space. For a submanifold sparse convolution, the input and output sparsity patterns are exactly the same. Each output location sees the nearby active locations in the input. Information can therefore only flow along the set of active spatial locations. This might sound like a major limitation, However, we'll see on the next slide how strided convolutions can be combined with a deconvolution operation to create large receptive fields. On the left, we show a toy input composed of two separate clusters of active locations. The white dot is moving over the set of active spatial locations. Next to that, we show the set of locations where a 3 by 3 convolutional filter with stride 2 can be placed such that it can see the highlighted input location. The third image shows the downsampled output of the strided convolution. Next, we show the effect of applying a 3 by 3 submanifold convolution. In the downsampled space, the two clusters from the input have merged, allowing information to flow between them. Finally, we add a sparse deconvolution operation, which reverses the downsampling from the initial strided convolution. This returns us to the input sparsity pattern. The three sparse operations combine to produce fairly large receptive fields. Extending this with residual connections allows us to build efficient UNET-style networks that produce an output feature vector for every active input spatial location with very large receptive fields, which is useful for learning the context necessary for 3D semantic segmentation. We initially applied this to 3D object segmentation and scene segmentation for the NYU Depth V2 RGBD dataset. Evaluating on the ShapeNet Core 55 dataset, we found that sparse units built with submanifold convolutions outperform dense 3D convnets and multi-view 2D convnets. Sparse convolutional networks are available as a PyTorch add-on package from GitHub. There's a utility function to build sparse units of different sizes. I applied sparse convnet to the ScanNet 3D semantic segmentation problem. I used a voxel size of 2 cm cubed. This resulted in an average IOU score of 72.5%. Since then, other people have also applied versions of SparseConfNet to the ScanNet dataset. Troy et al. modified SparseConfNet to run entirely on the GPU and achieved an accuracy of 73.6%. Han et al. combined SparseConfNet with Hough voting clustering techniques to achieve an accuracy of 76.4%. They also top the leaderboard for the 3D object detection problem. Finally, I would like to thank the organizers for arranging this workshop and for collecting the awesome ScanNet dataset. Thank you for listening.
Now we'll have Li Tiang from the Chinese University of Hong Kong speaking about point group for 3D semantic instance segmentation. Today I will introduce our work in large scale thin point cloud instance segmentation. Point group dual set point grouping for 3D instance segmentation. We know that semantic segmentation is a task to assign each point a semantic category, and the 3D instance segmentation needs to not only give the semantic label, but also specify the instance ID of each point. Overall, methods of instance segmentation could be roughly partitioned into two parts. The first is a detection-based or top-down approach, and the second is a segmentation-based or bottom-up approach. The well-known mask carcinogen is a typical top-down method in 2D that segments object masks in a prior bounding box. 3D SIS firstly adapts the mask carcinogen architecture to 3D, and the 3D bonnet proposes a single-stage anchor-free structure. On the other side, button-up approaches perform a pixel-level or point-level semantic segmentation and then generate instance masks by grouping the points into an arbitrary number of object instances. For example, in Burst method, a discriminative loss function is applied to push away pixels belonging to different instances and pull close pixels in the same instance and then pixels can be grouped into instances using the learned embeddings. MDML then applies the discriminative loss in 3D. Our method is also a bottom-up approach. Instead of adapting 2D methods to 3D, our method focuses more on the difference between 2D and 3D. Unlike 2D images, there is no view occlusion problem in 3D. 3D objects are usually complete as a whole and separated by some void space. So in our method, we make use of these properties to separate 3D points into instances. We first use a backbone network to extract per point features of the input point cloud. The backbone network could be any point feature extraction network. And in our implementation, we voxelize the point clouds and uh, construct the UNet with some manifold sparse convolution and sparse convolution to extract contexture and geometric information for each point. With sparse convolution, we could feed a high resolution 3D space into the network since only the valid voxels are stored. We then recover points from voxels to get the per point features. The discriminative pointwise features are then fed into two branches, a semantic branch for predicting a semantic label for each point, and an offset branch for producing a per-point offset vector to shift each point towards the centroid of its respective instance. We apply a multi-layer perception to produce semantic scores, and the semantic prediction is constrained by the conventional cross entropy loss. And for the offset loss, we observe that the distance from points to the instant centroids concentrates on some small values, so it's hard for the network to regress the offset of boundary points of some large objects. Thus, besides the conventional L1 regression loss, we also apply a direction loss which regularizes the direction of the predicted offset. Direction loss is irrelevant to the offset norm and makes sure that the offsets move points towards their instant centroids. After getting the semantic label, we could start to cluster. We use breadth-first search to group nearby points with the same semantic labels into one cluster. Two points with a distance less than a proper set radius r are defined as nearby points of each other. The radius r actually serves as a spatial constraints in clustering, so that two intercategory objects at a distance larger than r are not grouped into one. This clustering algorithm relies on the semantic label and void space between 3D objects. Um, the whole class clustering process is actually to find the semantically connected components. 
So it may fail when two intracategory objects lie near each other. For example, in this scene, when clustering based on the original coordinates p, some pictures high on the wall are wrongly grouped into a single cluster. However, remember that we have predicted an offset to instance center for each point. Thus, we could add the offsets to the original coordinates p to get the shifted coordinates q. Nearby objects with the, the shifted coordinates will have larger void space between them. And clustering based on shifted coordinates q could, to an extent, resolve the problem happened on original coordinates. For example, the pictures on the wall are successfully separated. However, clustering on Q also has its limitations. In this scene, the inaccuracy of offset prediction for the boundary points of the large curtain causes the clustering error. Clustering on P may misgroup nearby objects of the same class while clustering on Q may help to solve the problem but may fail to handle faraway points from centers. Thus, we employ dual point coordinate sets in clustering to combine their strengths. But there are duplicates in the union of the two cluster sets. And to select better clusters as a final instance prediction, we propose the SCORNET. The score net takes the candidate cluster set C as input. At first, we gather the point features from the feature map extracted by the backbone network to form the feature sets for each cluster. And then, the clusters are voxelized again and are fed into a small unit. A cluster well max pooling is then followed to produce a single cluster feature vector for each cluster. The Network finally gives a score for each cluster, and each score indicates the quality of a cluster. And to reflect the cluster quality in the scores, we use a soft label to supervise the predictive cluster scores. The IOUI here is the largest intersection over union between cluster CI and the ground truth instances. We then use a binary cross entropy loss as our score loss. After getting the cluster scores, we could feed the candidates into a non-maximum suppression process to get the final instance predictions G. And since we cluster based on the semantic information, the semantic label of a cluster is exactly the category the points in the cluster belongs to. In total, this is the whole inference process of our point group. Let's review the process. We feed the points into a backbone network followed by two branches to produce per point semantic label and offset to center. And we shift the original coordinates P to shift coordinates Q and perform clustering algorithm on P and on Q. The candidate clusters are then fed into SCORNET to get a score for each cluster. And an NMS is applied according to the scores to select better clusters. We conducted our experiments on the large-scale indoor scene dataset scanner. Here is a visualization comparison between clustering on P, on Q, and on dual sets. We could see that clustering on both P and Q makes use of the complementary properties of the two sets and thus performs best. The quantitative results also show the effectiveness of clustering on dual sets. The ablation experiments are conducted on the validation set of ScanNet dataset. And on ScanNet benchmark, our method also achieves a much higher performance compared to previous methods. We tested our inference time by randomly sampling four things in the validation set of ScanNet and tested 100 times for each thing. Compared to some point-based methods, which need to split the room into blocks and then merge them. Our method could take a whole thing as input per pass, thanks to the voxel-based backbone and sparse convolution. And thus, our method is faster than most previous methods. And then in our implementation, for points in the scene, neighboring points within an R sphere can be found in parallel in advance of the clustering to boost speed. 
That is, the clustering is actually divided into two operations. The first is bulk query and the second is breast first search. Generally, the inference time of a scene depends on the number of points and the scene complexity. Clustering on shifted coordinates Q usually takes more time than clustering on original coordinates P, as shifted, co shifted points could have more neighbors. Here is a visualization of the results of our point group on ScanNet. We also show some failure cases. Failure cases mostly relate to the semantic errors, as our method relies on the semantic results. In this case, fridge points are misclassified as wall and door, whereas some wall points are misclassified as window. Such semantic errors affect the instance grouping. Here is a visualization video which could better show the structure of the 3D scene. Thanks for your listening. Our code has been publicly released. If you have any question, feel free to contact me. Actually, let's skip this break uh, to be more on schedule. We now have Chris Choi from NVIDIA Research, who's topped the 3D semantic segmentation leaderboard with his Minkowski net and is speaking about sparse 3D perception. Hello, everyone. I'm Chris Choi from NVIDIA Research. Some of you might remember that I gave a 3D semantic segmentation winner talk last year. Today, I would like to talk about more general topics on 3D perception with sparse tensors. So, what is a sparse tensor? A sparse tensor is an n-dimensional extension of a sparse matrix. For example, if a, stack, a sparse matrix is along a new axis, then we have an ordered three sparse tensor. Uh, these sparse tensors can be represented as a set of nonzero values and associated coordinates. For example, coordinates are xi's and associated values are fi's. If we have a point cloud, then xi's can be the coordinates, and then the fi's can be the colors associated to each coordinate. And then, why should we use a sparse tensor to represent 3D data? Unlike 2D images where we have dense values or features on a grid, representing 3D data on a dense grid is extremely wasteful, since most of the space have no values. For example, with 2.5 centimeter voxel, 98% of the space is empty. Uh, thus, we need a sparse representation. Then let's compare some pros and cons of continuous and discrete representations. Uh, first, point clouds have no contagion error, but there's no bound on the number of neighbors, uh, random access is not possible, and it has a re irregular density. In addition, a uh, hierarchy is not defined and then requires a heuristic sampling. However, in sparse tensors, uh, it, there's a quantization error. If we use two centimeter voxel size, then one centimeter is the quantization error, the maximum quantization error. Uh, but there's a bound on the number of neighbors you can have, and then the random access is easy. And then hierarchy is deterministic and straightforward. So, using a sparse tensor gives a lot of advantages when we process large-scale point cloud. And we built a neural network library called Minkowski Engine for such spatially sparse tensors. Here I visualize some common discriminative network architectures, such as classification or segmentation network. In addition, Minkowski Engine provides features for generative sparse tensor networks using the generalized convolution. For example, a completion network can take a partial 3D observation and fill out the rest of the hidden part. 
a reconstruction network generates a 3D sparse tensor from a feature vector. Finally, we recently used this generative process for single shot object detection, which I will talk more about in the later parts of the talk. So in this talk, I will go over some of the applications of sparse tensors for 3D perception, and will present five papers. The first paper tackles 3D and 4D semantic segmentation, and the second paper is on 3D geometric features or representation learning. The next two papers are 2D and 3D registration papers, and the last paper proposes a generative 3D network for 3D single shot object detection. The first paper I will present is on 3D semantic segmentation. Uh, first, uh, let's define semantic segmentation. So 3D semantic segmentation is a problem pertaining to partitioning 3D scans or data into semantic parts. And similar to 2D semantic segmentation, we can solve this problem by labeling each voxel or point in the 3D scan as one of the predefined semantic labels. Here I visualized an input 3D point cloud and network prediction on the right side. In this paper, we proposed a very deep convolutional neural network for 3D semantic segmentation. Specifically, on our CVPR19 submission, uh, we achieved the best result on the benchmark with a component which consists of 42 convolution layers. Also, thanks to the similarity between traditional convolutional libraries and Minkowski Engine, we were able to reuse many popular neural network architectures such as residual networks and UNIT. Uh, here we visualize the network architectures of uh, Resonant 18 and our high dimensional counterpart. Uh, we were able to achieve a large performance jump on the benchmark. Specifically, we were able to outperform the previous year's best method by more than 20%. Uh, here is a typical prediction of our network. On the top, you can see the input, the network prediction. And on the bottom right corner, we visualize the difference between the ground truth and prediction. Uh, note that except for very few regions, our network was able to predict the semantic labels very accurately. In previous problems, we assume that we have a static 3D scan. But in many robotic setup, we have a stream of 3D scans. For example, in this video, we have a sequence of 3D scans in an autonomous driving setup. In this setup, uh, we can create a four-dimensional confident and train on a 4D semantic segmentation data set. Uh, without any post-processing, the network prediction is very smooth and consistent thanks to the 4D convolutions. The next paper I will present is Fully Convolutional Geometric Features, in which we propose the fast and accurate 3D geometric features. Specifically, generating geometric features is the first step in the 3D registration pipeline. First, we need to extract features and match those to get initial correspondences. Then, we filter out outliers and estimate the rigid transformation. Optionally, we can fine-tune the final registration. And many works proposed hand-designed 3D geometric features. Uh, and recently, we saw a lot of uh, search on the learning-based 3D features. However, all these features extract a uh, small 3D patch around interest point to map the local geometry within the patch to a vector representation. This limits the, the context a network can see since the largest context is limited by the crop size of the patch. In addition, as features are extracted from patches independently, all computations must start from scratch uh, even when there is an overlap between patches. Finally, many of these learned features require some low-level geometry as an input, which is sometimes expensive to compute. However, we can adopt the fully convolutional metric learning, uh, first proposed in the universal correspondence network. The idea in this paper is that we do not have to compute everything from scratch and can share the intermediate features. We apply this fully convolutional metric learning to efficiently learn 3D geometric features. 
However, unlike Universal Correspondence Network, where we learn features for all pixels, we use a sparse tensor for 3D representation and enforce the loss only on the valid surface. Also, we use a Minkowski unit, which is a combination of a residual network and a unit built on the Minkowski engine. Specifically, we enforce features extracted from a positive pair to be close to each other, while enforcing features are from a negative pair to be at least marginal way in the feature space. In addition, to speed up the feature learning process, we propose the hardest contrastive loss. The main idea is that instead of sampling hardest negatives independently, we sample the hardest negatives for all positive features. This allows the decision boundary to be sharper and features to be more accurate since the decision boundary is only defined by the hardest negatives. Experimentally, we train networks with and without the hardest negative mining until convergence and show that hardest negative sampling improves the registration recall by a large margin. We also compare our method with all 3D geometric features on the 3D match benchmark and plot the feature extraction speed on the x-axis and the feature match recall on the y-axis. Note that learned features must sacrifice the speed to get good accuracy and some hand-designed features must trade off this accuracy for speed. But our features, FCGF, outperformed all baselines while being the fastest. Next, given the features, we can find a rigid transformation and register 3D point clouds. And we recently published two papers on the 3D registration. The first paper is deep global registration, and the second paper is high dimensional commonance for geometric pattern recognition. So in the 3D registration pipeline, we first extract features and match across point clouds, which gives us initial correspondences. However, not all correspondences are accurate, and we must filter the outliers before registration. RANSEC, for example, does this by randomly sampling until it finds a subset without outliers. In this work, we propose filtering the outliers with a six-dimensional convolutional network. To understand this, we first have to understand the geometric structure 3D correspondences form in a 6D space. Let XYZ1 and 2 to be a correspondence. A correct correspondence will satisfy the transformation equation. If we reorganize the equation by concatenating the coordinates, we get three hyperplane equations. In other words, the inliers form a subspace in a 60 space, whereas outliers form noise outside the subspace. And finding the inliers is equivalent to segmenting them from the noise and in 2D and 3D convolutional neural networks are the most successful method for segmentation. And that's why we use a 6D convolutional neural network to segment the inliers. The next step in the pipeline is transformation estimation. The conventional method for estimating the 3D rigid transformation is procrastus analysis, where you find the rotation and translation that minimize the sum of squared errors. However, it weighs all correspondences equally, which is not valid in our case. Instead, we can use weighted sum of squares, and we show that it has a closed foam solution, and we can pass gradients through the weights. And we named this weighted procrastus, and it has a couple advantages. First, as we pass gradients through the weights, the complexity is linear to the number of correspondences, which allows us to process many correspondences efficiently. Second, we can assign zero to the weights and remove correspondences, which is important when we have no overlap like the regions highlighted in circles. Lastly, the fine-tuning module uses a robust loss function and optimizes the pose using SGD. For continuous rotation representation, we use the orthogonal representation proposed by Zoe et al. We train and test our networks on the 3D Match Benchmark. The 3D Match Benchmark is a collection of 3D scans of indoor scenes for 3D reconstruction and has been widely used for feature matching and registration. And it also contains a lot of challenging scenes with low overlap. 
we use the registration recall as our main metric, which measures the number of successful registrations. First, note that the latest learning-based algorithm that require almost complete overlap fail on the 3D match benchmark, since many pairs have very small overlap. Next, ICP variants including point-to-point -point and point-to-plane uh, fail to achieve about uh, less than 10% recall. Uh, globally optimal ICP variants including GoICP and uh, SuperPub PCS achieve around 20% recall. FGR and RENSEC achieve better performance but are below 75% on average. In this difficult dataset, our method achieves a significant performance improvement and it achieves 92% registration recall. In addition, we use the outdoor LiDAR scans from the Kitty dataset for pairwise registrations. We also apply our method on the multi-way registration frameworks. And this is a visualization of our multi-way registration results on the LiDAR RGBD dataset apartment scene. Similarly, this is our registration results of an office scene. The last paper is Generative Sparse Detection Networks for 3D single-shot object detection. In image-based single-shot object detection, we generate bounding box predictions densely at every pixel. But in commercial 3D scans, we do not observe the interior of the object, which leads to an interesting question of how we generate these anchor boxes from 3D surfaces. In this paper, we adopted the recent generative uh, pipeline for sparse tensors to create bounding box anchors. We start from the input point cloud and then we apply a series of deconvolution and pruning to generate a new set of coordinates that contain anchors that are semantically different from the input. And here is the overall visualization of the architecture, which is a pyramid network that increases and decreases uh, sequentially uh, tensor strides to generate new coordinates. Interestingly, since this is a fully convolutional network, we can process an entire floor of the Stanford data set or an entire house easily. In conclusion, a sparse tensor is a powerful representation that can be useful for many applications. Uh, due to the fast random access and the compactness, we can do a lot of operations fast, which is also crucial for training a large network longer. However, I think that we can combine the continuous representations at the front and the end of the network to preserve the original resolution to make use of the pros of the both representations. Also, combining with an occupancy network uh, seems to be a promising direction. Currently, we are adding uh, full GPU backends for Minkowski Engine and will be released in a few weeks. If you uh, have suggestions or bugs, feel free to send an email to me. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, thanks, Chris, for the great talk. So we can we can take a few questions. So I've got one question about like operating with sparse tensors on a bit of a general level. Um, what do you think about uh, the representation within the sparse tensor itself? So like representing occupancies um, versus uh, you know colors or um, SDFs. Uh, and whether that has an, an impact on the perception tasks. Oh, yeah, I think uh, that's a good question. So, oh, uh, uh, can you hear me, by the way? Yeah. Okay, cool. So, I think uh, the, those explicit representations uh, are very useful at the front and the at the end of the network, but I think uh, uh, representing all these rep, uh, information uh, using implicit uh, representation, such as just uh, feature vector, would be more powerful uh, than those explicit representations. But I think um, uh, those uh, explicit representations also have advantages in that uh, we actually have a, a greater control over these uh, 
uh, representations, and thus we can make the network uh, to generate what we want uh, if we use those explicit representations. But uh, during the propagation, uh, neural network uh, feed for pass, uh, I think uh, it's probably better uh, to use implicit representations rather than explicit ones. Mm -hmm. So do you have a, a preference um, on, you know, what kind of input output represent or input representations, I guess, do you think there's like a, would be a difference between having a sparse occupancy versus like a sparse SDF um, in terms of the ability to, to represent the input? Oh, I see. Um, um, I think, uh... Both methods uh, are uh, I would probably lead to very comparable results. I think if we train those networks uh, longer, uh, but I think uh, depending on the application area, such as uh, if you want to actually do differentiation uh, through, uh, let, let's say, differential render, probably occupancy network or like uh, SDF. Uh, uh, but with the uh, colors would be better uh, compared to like discretized, uh, let's say voxel representations. Uh, but I think uh, occupancy network uh, in that uh, it, it, it is more compact that uh, we don't actually need to represent uh, high resolution space uh, with many voxels. I think uh, it would be probably uh, faster to train, more accurate, uh, and it will be able to give us a fine uh, resolution output in the end. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, thanks again, Chris, for the, the great presentation and uh, a lot of cool work. Next, I'd like to introduce Francis Engelman from RWTH Aachen to speak about his impressive work on 3D semantic instance segmentation. Hello, everyone. In this talk, we present our work 3D MPA, a multi-proposal aggregation method for 3D semantic instance segmentation. We also compare our approach to other recent methods such as point group and OQSEC, which are also presented here at CVPR and the Scanet workshop. My name is Francis Engelmann. I am a PhD student at AWTH Aachen University with Bastian Leibel. And this work was performed during a summer internship at Google Munich with Martin Bokelo, Ali Reza Fasi, and Matthias Niesner from the Technical University of Munich. The task we solve in this work is 3D semantic instance segmentation that is given a input 3D point cloud we want to segment the scene into individual object instances and assign a semantic label to each of the instances. Previous approaches for 3D instance semantic segmentation can be divided into two groups. The first group contains top-down or proposal-based methods such as 3D BOnet or 3D Sys. Similar to Mask RCNN, they first generate a large number of object proposals and then segment the points inside each proposal bounding box into foreground and background. However, these approaches cannot recover from missing object proposals. They require numerous hyperparameters for the anchors and they are a bit wasteful since most proposals are rejected again 
during the final non-maximum suppression step. On the other side, we have bottom-up or proposal-free methods such as 3D Bevis or MTML. These methods learn in the first stage a feature embedding for each point of the input scene and then in the second stage they cluster the embedding features into the final object instances. However, by learning an embedding, the loss function does not directly minimize the actual objective function of instance segmentation. Furthermore, clustering a large number of high-dimensional features can be computationally expensive. Our 3D MPA method combines the advantages of both approaches while avoiding the mentioned drawbacks. Before going into the details of the model, let's have a quick look of our approach. From an input 3D point cloud, each foreground point votes for its object center. We then generate proposals by sampling from predicted object centers and grouping points that voted for the same object center. Then we learn proposal features which we use to aggregate multiple proposals and finally obtain an instant segmentation and the corresponding semantic labels. Here we show our full 3D MPA model. Let's now have a look at individual components. The input to our method is a 3D point cloud consisting of n points with i-dimensional features. Here we use point positions, color and normals. Similar to other recent methods including point group and OQSEC, we rely on a sparse volumetric backbone to learn meaningful geometric and semantic features. In particular, for each point, we predict a semantic class and a center offset. Note that this setup is directly comparable to the backbone and the two branches of point group. We supervise the center offset only for foreground points, so we ignore the semantic classes wall and floor, and minimize a smooth L1 loss, also known as Uber loss. Compared to point group, the directional loss introduced in MTML might also be beneficial here. Here on the right, we illustrate the center prediction process. Starting from the input point cloud, each point predicts a center, which we show here in blue. Next, we generate proposals by taking k random samples from the predicted center positions and group the points that voted for the same center. For each proposal, we compute a d-dimensional proposal feature by applying PointNet on the sparse convolutional features of the grouped points. In summary, each proposal consists of a three-dimensional proposal position, a learned d-dimensional feature, and a set of points associated to the corresponding proposal. In our first baseline experiment, we follow the top-down instant segmentation paradigm as for example used in Mars-Gaussian. 
we can now predict a binary foreground background mask for the points of each proposal, as well as a semantic class and an objectness score. By passing the proposals through non-maximum suppression, we obtain the predicted semantic instances. However, this does not work too well, especially for large objects where accurate center prediction is more difficult. Therefore, we propose to replace non-maximum suppression with multi-proposal aggregation based on the proposal positions or additionally learned features. We compare two kinds of learned features, embedding features, which we learn using the discriminative loss function from Prabandera et al, and geometric features, which consist in regressing the radius of the object bounding sphere and a refined object center. Compared to concurrent work, OcuSec by Han et al uses the same discriminative loss and comparable to the object radius, OcuSec predicts the number of voxels in an instance. Both are measures for the physical size of an object. Finally, the refined center is comparable to the proposal generation step in VoteNet. We evaluate three aggregation strategies. The first one aggregates proposals based on the proposal position, which already shows that aggregating proposals improves over non-maximum suppression. When using learned features to aggregate the proposals, the geometric features outperform the embedding features. Additionally, the, um, the geometric features have the nice property that they are interpretable, unlike the high dimensional embedding features. As a last component, a graph convolutional network enables direct interactions between proposals as opposed to point level interactions in the sparse volumetric backbone. The nodes of the graph correspond to the proposal positions and an edge between two nodes exists if the Euclidean distance between them is smaller than two meters. In a way, our proposals with the associated points can also be interpreted as a type of oversegmentation of the 3D scene, similar to the supervoxels in OcuSec, which also relies on the graph to merge multiple supervoxels. In our experiments, we were able to observe an additional small improvement due to the graph convolutional network. We reach the end of this talk and finish by showing additional qualitative results. First, we show the input 3D point cloud, then the predicted semantic labels, and finally the predicted instance masks. Please also have a look at our project page and additional qualitative results. Thank you for watching. Thanks, Francis, for the, the great talk. So we can take some questions now. I guess it's too late for questions. Everybody's falling asleep. 
Um, so I'm kind of curious, like, so this seems like a nice um, uh, approach in with the sort of hybrid um, instance detection. So what do you think is kind of missing still? Um, I mean, it seems like there might be a potential to get slightly more accurate based on, um, I don't know, like color boundary information. Uh, or, I mean, so what do you think is like the, the big thing that might still be um, able to be exploited to get better performance? Um, yeah, so I, I think one component that can still be improved in this work is the, um, how we actually aggregate uh, the, the proposals. In the end, this is some kind of uh, clustering, right? Um, if you think about it, uh, the non-maximum suppression step in um, top-down methods uh, is also some kind of uh, some kind of clustering, right? Except that you only take the the proposal with the highest score and not ignore the other ones with uh, that have a large uh, intersection of a union. Um, so here, um, at the moment, we learn features to. Uh, that we then later use in an offline step to to actually cluster the proposals together. I think um, if you would be able to fully um, learn the clustering in an in an end-to-end -end, in a truly end-to-end -end trainable method, I guess there would be the, first it would be a nicer method, but I think it might also help to um, to improve the scores. Yeah, that makes sense. Maybe one more question. So like, um, do you think this is also easily extending to a larger variety of like object scales? So I guess uh, currently in like these indoor scenes, you have largely a similar kind of scale of furniture. If you wanted to also detect much smaller objects like pens um, and cups and stuff like this, uh, do you think this is also being easily extended? So, I think that's uh, maybe one of the nice things of these methods that um, you can um, split the scenes into into multiple proposals, right? You you, you it's it's perfectly fine if you have um, if one particular kind of object has let's say one hundred proposals that you then later merge together, whereas if you have uh, let's say a very small pen lying on top of of a table, uh, probably needs only one proposal in the sense that. Um, one proposal would be enough to fully cover that object. Um, one thing that might be tuned a little bit, uh, that, that might require some tuning, would be the, the center regression, um, which, um, yeah, it, it doesn't work. Uh, it, it works much better for small objects than for, for big objects. But since uh, we allow uh, an object to have multiple proposals, um, this, this, uh, I guess this, this makes why it, uh, this makes it work. Yeah. Uh, great. Thanks. Um, thanks again for the presentation and thanks for staying up so late in, in Europe. Time. No worries. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. Finally, we have Tian Sung from Tsinghua to speak about OcuSeg, which currently leads on both the 3D semantic segmentation and the 3D semantic instance segmentation leaderboards. Hi, this is Tian Zheng from Tsinghua University. I'm happy to be here presenting our work, OcuSeg, Occupancy Aware 3D Instance Segmentation. Our work uses sparse convolutional networks, so I will first give an introduction to that. In sparse convolutional networks, the data distribution is spatially sparse, meaning only a few locations contain data, whereas most places are empty. 3D point cloud is a perfect example, as most points only exist on the object surface. 
The idea of sparse ComNet is to exploit sparsity of 3D data to make the computation more efficient. Generally, only non-empty locations are involved in computation and storage. Compared to dense 3D uh, convolution, sparse ComNet allows larger and deeper networks. However, in practice, both submanifold sparse ComNet and Minkowski engine require over two seconds to process around two million points, which is not enough for real-time prediction and fast training. So our previous work tried to address the, the performance issue of sparse ComNet. We introduced the adaptive chunk-based sparse 3D convolution strategy and achieved a four times speed up compared to SSCN. And this is the basis for this work, Arcuset. The idea is to group spatially close data points into chunks so that we can avoid most random GPU memory access by caching into the GPU shared memory. We adaptively split the input space into chunks of multiple levels. This is an example of the process in 2D. Each time we split overcrowded chunks into smaller chunks so that we make sure each resulting chunk contains a similar number of features. In this way, load for each chunk is balanced and the parallel computation can be more efficient. Next, we will introduce our method for 3D instance segmentation. Traditionally, there are two stages. Firstly, some embedding is learned, then a clustering stage is used to generate the final instance proposal. On top of that, we learned a novel occupancy signal and use it to guide the clustering stage. The motivation behind is that unlike 2D images, 3D models are not affected by the scale and occlusion ambiguity. Therefore, the size of an instance could be robustly predicted and be used to guide the instance segmentation process. This figure below illustrates the case. In 2D images, if we measure the occupancy of 2D instance by the number of, of pixels, we may find the, the occupancy is, is largely affected by the viewpoint, while in 3D, the volume of each instance is fixed as long as the scanning is complete. So our work largely follows the uh, learning then clustering framework. In the learning stage, a multitask 3D unit is used to learn multiple features including the spatial term, the feature term and their covariances, and, and the occupancy signal. And in the, in the clustering stage, we first perform a graph cut cl clustering um, of the input model and we get the super voxel result. We use the super voxel result to initialize the graph and we measure the um, uh, similarity of two uh, vertices according to the uh, embedding terms that we've learned. And based on the similarity, we iteratively merge the graph until we have the final result. With the spatial term, we want to predict a three-dimensional vector that regresses to the, the object center. We used an L1 regression loss here D1 is the predicted displacement vector to the underlying instance center. Mu i is the location of the ith voxel of the seed instance. The feature term uses a discriminative loss to learn an embedding space where the voxels belonging to the same instance are close while voxels from different instances are far away. This is done by the three parts of the loss. The first part draws the intra-instance voxels together. The second part pushes different instances away from each other, plus a regularization term. For the covariance term, since both spatial term and the feature term model the inter-instance similarity, the covariance term aims to learn an optimal clustering region for each instance by adaptive, adaptively weighing for these two terms. We use the sigma s and sigma d 
for the predicted covariance for the uh, feature and the spatial terms. We take the average and get the covariance for each instance and then compute the probability of whether the ith voxel belongs to the cth instance. This term is then be trained using a binary cross entropy loss. The occupancy term is supervised by the number of voxels occupied by the underlying instance. We predict the log of the actual occupancy for the numerical stability. We also used a L1 regression loss in training. In the clustering stage, we initialize the graph using pre-clustered supervoxels. Then we measure the similarity of two connected vertices by Wij. Here S and D are the spatial term and the feature term mentioned before. The R is defined as the ratio of the merged cluster over the predicted occupancy. So if the R is small, which means the, the merged cluster is smaller than the predicted occupancy, the Wij is larger and it encourages the current vertex to be merged. Our ablation study shows the occupancy gives a 5% boost on the MAP at uh, 0 0.5. This, this is the quantitative results that we get on the scanned instant segmentation benchmark. So our, our methods outperform all the other methods and reach the top one result on the benchmark. And this is the qualitative results that are predicted on real-world scenes. You can see that the, um, for most of the scenes, uh, our model generalizes well. So next, we want to discuss about the synergy between the instance and semantic segmentation. We found that instance and semantic could benefit each other based on the two observations. The first is that the points belonging to the same instances usually have the same semantic label. And second, instance segmentation is more coherent in space because of the um, spatial embedding constraint. One straightforward solution is to enforce the voxels belonging to the same instances to share the, the same semantic label, which however um, leads to poor performance when the instance segmentation is incorrect. This problem can be formulated in the setting of a conditional random field on the supervox solar representation. It could be efficiently solved since the number of supervoxel is limited. Um, as is shown in, in the examples, where in the left figure we visualize the semantic predictions of the, the raw result and the refined result is, is visualized in, in the middle. The incorrect, incorrect pieces of the semantic labels are corrected by the CRF optimizer. The quantitative results demonstrate that the proposed solution improves the semantic segmentation by 3% in the average IOU metric. So in terms of the runtime performance, recall that we used the accelerated version of sparse combat introduced by our previous work. Um, Accusac is fast enough to be uh, performed online on a portable device and we will show a live demo in a minute. So our method uh, outperforms uh, other methods by large margin uh, in terms of the performance. And this is our live demo that is on a Surface Book with an Axis Action sensor. And now we're showing the live uh, joint 3D reconstruction and with uh, instance segmentation labels updated uh, online on the portable device.
this is our result for the geometry and the colored geometry and finally the instance segmentation result this is the end of our presentation and if you're interested please visit our website or contact us thank you All right, so now we will have our um, final two invited talks. Next, we have a talk by Yasu Furukawa, who's a professor at Simon Fraser University. He also has done some really cool work in reconstructing 3D and understanding 3D layouts from RGB and RGBD. So he'll be giving a pretty interesting talk titled, CVPR is a Contemporary Art Exhibition. So again, feel free to ask questions on Zoom and YouTube, and we'll collect them to discuss at the end of the workshop. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Uh, I'm Yasu Furukawa from Simon Fraser University. I'd like to first thank the organizers for inviting me to give a talk. Uh, I'm thrilled to be a part of this great workshop. And this is going to be an unusual talk, as you can see from the title. And uh, whenever I give a talk at workshop, I mention this, that the workshop is the most exciting part of the conference, beyond the main conference, because I can speak uh, with my own free will. I can speak anything. Uh, first, I also ye say uh, yes to give a talk at another workshop on C understanding. And the two talks as a set actually makes a complete uh, story. So if you're interested in what I'll talk about today, you can also look at the talk uh, in another workshop, which is also very cool. Uh, I have been working on reconstructing CAD model or CAD-like models. It's difficult to define CAD model. Uh, I call it structured geometry or more uh, descriptively, semantically segmented geometry, I might call it that way. Uh, so I have a geometry which are segmented, uh, respecting underlying semantics or properties. Uh, you probably know what I mean. So at the bottom, you see the movie clip from the movie Transformer. Uh, it's pretty amazing. And this is possible by the CAD models. And unfortunately, the only way to get it is by manually, by professional modelers at the moment. And these models are effective for editing, mapping, effects mapping, physics simulations, interactions, etc. Not at this quality. But we have been working on reconstructing CAD-like models uh, from outdoor, indoor, ground level, aerial, etc. And here is a list of papers at the top tier vision conferences. Uh, so these are successes, uh, very nice results, some technical innovation. But I want to set a high standard in ranking or evaluating how useful or how much impact uh this work has given so at the right these are the 
really good one. Robust works very well. Uh, production ready or being used in production. At the left, not really, or not uh, far from being able to give an impact. Uh, it shows a red face icon. This shows anger, anger of an engineer who implemented it, found out it doesn't work at all. Uh, so that's the red icon. About a week ago, Aaron Hertzman posted an essay about contemporary art. He is a famous computer graphics, vision, machine learning researcher. Uh, this essay is about contemporary art with some reference to uh, computer graphics, vision uh, communities. What I found interesting was a post by Alyosha Efros. 90% of CVPL papers will turn out to be junk, either immediately or after a few years. So is 90% of contemporary art. Uh, this is not the main point of Aaron's essay, but the, from what you can read in that article, uh, you can interpret that way. And by the way, Aaron always writes amazing essay articles. You should go and read it if you haven't. So I mean, if I, I'm going to add a few words here, I'm adding three words. Uh, so from this conversation, the post, I can say that the CVPR is a contemporary art exhibition. Most stuffs are garbages, junk. If you can find one or two pieces that speak to you, it's a great success. So uh, given that the two highly respected researchers uh, talk about these, uh, I can interpret this way. CVPR is a contemporary art exhibition. Most ideas are actually bad. So uh, let's stop pretending that all our papers convey good ideas. Mostly they're actually bad. Uh, but my point is, actually bad ideas have a meaning. Garbage is a source for impact. So uh, we should start admitting what are good things, good ideas, bad ideas, which are presented in CVPR papers that help us move forward. So uh, getting back to this, uh, this is a part you have to refer to my other talk to get a full picture. But the uh, that picture was incomplete because it's not showing how ideas actually flow forward. So for example, at the left papers with red uh, angry icons, there are some good ideas uh, which propagate to another papers say uh, this orange and yellow, uh, not ready, not robust enough for real use, which nobody outside of computer vision were interested in, but these uh, ideas lead to the work with the impact. But uh, this paper, for example, my hat the world of stereo, uh, fairly well cited paper, 400 citations, uh, there's no way to impact. Uh, we extended the work, but kind of gave up on the idea at this point, because we realized later, this is a bad idea, actually. But there are more arrows actually missing. So red arrows are the lessons learned lesson, lessons learned arrow. We learned something about for the research, so we did the opposite, because this was not a good idea. Or the idea lead us to another way. Uh, so given those red arrows, uh, this paper had a passes to an impact later actually so very important we have another arrow uh, coming from the top from other papers from other fields or arrow coming out of nowhere somehow student uh, came up with their own idea which i didn't see the source and uh, there are some lessons i want to convey very higher level for structured geometry what should be you should be careful Again, these messages, uh, you can look at the other talk in the other workshop. So today I want to talk about uh, some of our recent works uh, with these messages. In particular, uh, two papers, uh, left is CVPR 2020, right is archive paper. So let's look at the first paper, uh, Convolutional Message Passing Network. Uh, I like this work because this is actually a very simple idea, works well. So in the previous diagram, really could be a shining piece. Not production ready yet, but this idea can, I believe, highly likely lead to impact in the future, so hopefully. 
first, let's just remove convolutional uh, message passing network, MPN. Uh, is a general uh, category of neural network, which is a subset of graph neural network. Although you might know this, but let me just quickly review. Uh, right is a graph neural network or MPN, message passing neural network. Left is a component and how they differ. In component, as you know, every pixel is a feature, has a feature vector. And at the right, uh, assume I detected corner candidates of a building, enumerated ca edge candidates of a building. So uh, there are many more candidates, but I just assume there are three corner candidates and four edge candidates. They're connected if they are incident, uh, in incident relationship. So in component, you update feature at a pixel by mixing features at the neighboring pixel. So you take these nine features, and then mix up to update. That's how component does. In graph NN, suppose you want to update this feature at the node. You take the neighboring nodes, uh, mix features and update, or send messages. For another feature again, uh, if the kernel is three by three, that's how component does, mixing these information by a common kernel. In graph NN, again, you find the neighboring pixels and then send messages and update. And after that, for corner detection, for example, you ask this feature vector, are you a corner? Uh, say, put some uh, network, the one by one component or MLP to get a value. Uh, for this, we uh, again add up a decoder, maybe to a feature vector and ask, are you correct? This is edge is correct. So we only collect the primitives which are assigned to be correct and then form the final graph. Uh, so component is amazing, as you know, uh, for graph and then for our kinds of problem, such as geometry, I was highly skeptical. Uh, doesn't seem to be working really well, uh, or at least similar performance to uh, reasonably well implemented baseline or so heuristic algorithms. That seems to be the case. So why graph and then doesn't work well for structured geometry reconstruction? Two reasons from what we see. First, uh, graph and then removes spatial information, where they are. So it's like at the left, this is the original, say, uh, toy example, six corner candidates. Uh, you can see that the oh, these four edges are the true building boundary edges easily, and these five ones are fake. But once you just take out feature vectors and forget about where they are, so if they go to component from uh, graph and representation, it's very difficult. So you, it's more like asking you, given this graph, what four edges and what four corners are correct? It's very difficult. Of course, there are many tricks to somehow associate the coordinates into a feature vector, like called a conv, uh, but it doesn't actually work well. So it's very difficult to store spatial information uh, in feature vectors and reason by, say, MLP. It's very difficult. And really, graph NN is good for a graph without spatial embedding, like semantic graph, or more higher level, uh, say, connection between objects, humans, cows, or houses. Uh, you don't really have to have a special uh, spatial information. Uh, it can be very rough, or there are people, there is a cow, and hence the ground may be a grass. You don't really have to worry about where they are precisely. For our problem, spatial information is critical, and graph NN is bad because of this. Another reason is uh, message passing is very weak. Uh, this is actually the permutation invariance, which to me is a bad thing. You lose the power. Uh, component is permutation invariant because it cares about locations of every pixel. That's why it's very powerful, I think. So uh, in GNN, message passing is very weak. Um, not much higher order, no higher order. So suppose you update this feature vector. You take these features, uh, send the messages. The problem is it's permutation invariant. Sorry, I said wrong. Convenient is permutation variant. That's why it's great. Uh, graph NN is permutation invariant, 
the problem is they actually don't know where these three edges are related spatially with respect to the corner, although we know it, but we removed it uh, in converting the feature vector. So it's more like you just take this feature vector uh, and call the message and just sum or pool, do max pooling. Uh, aggregating information is very poor, so not much interesting higher order relations are used, utilized. So now here comes our idea. Very simple. That's why I like it. Uh, convolutional message passing neural network, uh, or ConvMPN. Uh, we do some two, two things. Uh, instead of storing a feature vector at each pixel or node, we simply replace by feature volume, meaning just a feature image in like a, every component. So now features are images, feature volume, instead of a vector. So we just use convolutions instead of MLP to encode messages. Let me use this example to illustrate. Again, a simple rectangular building. We enumerate four green corner candidates and six edge candidates. And uh, we form a relational graph for graph NN or message passing using edge nodes. So here I use node, but actually these are edge, building edges. Building nodes are not in the graph. So out of six edge candidates, I want to pick four correct edges, which is one, two, one, four, three, four, and two, three. And here is how we update a feature vector by convolution. So suppose I want to update a feature vector here. Uh, we first initialize feature as a feature volume instead of feature vector. So we simply put the image of a building and also a binary mask uh, where white pixels are on the edge of uh, this node. So this node is this edge of a building, suppose. So we just concatenate and make a two, a four channel feature volume. Then just do a convolution to make a feature volume. And same thing for all the other edges. So these feature volumes are covering the same building domain. So spatial information are preserved. And you update feature for this node. There are four neighbors here. You actually simply do pooling, uh, usually max pooling uh, instead of average or instead of some pooling. But you can do any pooling, say max pooling, and you get one feature volume. Concatenate with the original, and then do convolution. And I'm saying that this has a higher order uh, because we actually do pooling. We have to just pool. We, uh, which is sounds bad, but actually this is a special feature volume, three dimensional feature volume instead of one D vector. Dimensions are too higher, and usually information of this edge is uh, probably stored nearby these pixels, feature pixels, so they do not collide much in this pooling operation. So all the informations of the neighbors, good neighboring information, are stored here. Then Convnet can mix all the information effectively. Uh, so likely we are exploiting some higher order uh, relationships. So as you can see, uh, this representation, very simple, keeps spatial information and enables higher order reasoning. That's why it should work better. And uh, this is just a step to uh, update feature for this node, just simultaneously for all the nodes and repeat a few times. And after that, you get a feature volume, uh, put a decoder, just a conv encoder, and uh, regress a single scalar value. Uh, it's one that's a correct uh, true edge, zero false edge. We want these edges to have value one true. If you want to see math formula, uh, normal message passing neural network may work like this in a general form. Uh, to update feature vector for V, so for every neighboring node W, you concatenate and encode a message, and you sum. And this is a bad portion. You have to just sum because it has to be permutation invariant. Then maybe again put the original feature vector, uh, concatenate uh, massage with MLP to update. Uh, for ConvMPN, actually simpler, you just pool all the feature volumes, make a feature volume, original feature volume, and convenient. That's even simpler. The only thing is it takes memory. 
so it's not good if you have many, many nodes or edge candidates, uh, a lot. Uh, if you have enough memory, GPU memory to store, uh, much more powerful. So the, the bottom are the ground truth and top are our results. This is actually a very difficult problem. It is doing the instance of weta segmentation of a building as opposed to as opposed to just extracting the building exterior boundary. Uh, so it's actually a different problem than most other, maybe uh, all the other papers are trying to tackle in the literature. Of course, there are actually many mistakes you see. Uh, it's actually a very difficult problem. Uh, if you compare with other methods, you can tell uh, three other, uh, two other methods, one baseline. If you look close, there are many uh, self-intersections of bad results edges in the other. Uh, our result has much better topological uh, graph structure. In some numbers, uh, we compute some scores based on three primitives, zero dimensional corner, one dimensional edge, and two dimensional regions. Uh, regions are actually the most informative, matched well with our uh, perceptual uh, ranking, uh, qualitative evaluation. Uh, and the bottom is the hours. And this method is the uh, more optimization, very complicated optimization based method. That's why it's much better. Uh, but this is a uh, much simpler, uh, fully newer version, which outperforms the other methods. So that's the left. Uh, now I talk about the right. Uh, floor plan generation with a relational uh, GAN but using ConvMPN as a backbone. So this task is uh, architects. Uh, when they design floor plan, they start from bubble diagram like this. So enumerate all the rooms and find think about connections from this. They generate many layouts to see which one are the best. Uh, maybe pick some, think about, oh, this part is good, this part is bad. Go back, refine it, and then generate again. And iterate uh, many times. And this operation is time consuming. So you want to automate uh, from bubble diagram, graph without spatial embedding, to the actual layout. Uh, that's a task. And this is how we do a bit complicated, which I don't like. It should be simple, reproducible. Uh, but actually, very simple, actually. So, first, since our input is a bubble diagram, uh, which is a graph, so this is the essentially a bubble diagram. Uh, every node is a room, and uh, if room has a connection, we have an edge. And this feature vector is a room property. You're only using a room type as one hot encoding, like a kitchen, bedroom, etc. But you can also put the room size uh, as a room feature. So we add a noise vector because this is a generator of a GAN. Uh, then reform to a feature volume in the domain of a floor plan to generate. So we have a graph of a feature volume. Then we do message passing. Uh, so these arrows are message pass. This is a convent PN. This is a feature volume. So we do convolutions to update send messages. We do convent PN. The up sample, uh, the typical uh, decoder style. We uh, ha make the feature volume higher resolution and repeat. And massage messages, massage features if you convert PN up sample for three times. Then after that, for each feature volume, you put an encoder, convenet encoder, they get the room mask. So we put these together, add some heuristics to convert to a vector format. Uh, this is essentially the raster floor plan. This is the generator. So now decoder, uh, input is again graph of room masks uh, so each node has a binary mask and we do again convert for each one to make a turn to a feature volume so we now again have a graph of feature volume so we do convert pn to update feature vector this time down sample convert pn uh, again repeat three times then after that we uh, do encoding to each feature volume to get a feature vector pull to one feature vector and do MLP to answer yes, no, because this is a discriminator. So this again, uh, looks a bit complicated, but if you really uh, make it 
high level. It's very simple. The orange one. This is a graph of noise vectors to start. It's a graph of vector at the end. So uh, symmetric beautifully. Generate a discriminator. In the middle is the feature volume. Graph of feature volume representation for convent PN and up sampling, down sampling. Then uh, this is our representation of a, a flow plan. Graph of room masks. And here are some results on uh, the left. This is the input graph. A color shows the uh, room type information. And then this is the generated uh, the room layout, a house layout. And two baselines and two uh, competing methods and our method. Uh, so given a single graph, each method has to generate many. So as you can see that the our graph has more diversity. Diversity is actually the most difficult one. Usually they just pick one example, which is good, cannot generate any other, or just doesn't look good. And quantitatively, we evaluate on three kinds, uh, realism by user study, diversity by a uh, typical metric in the literature, and compatibility is the graph edit distance with the input, meaning uh, the input graph constraint, so edge actually meaning that these two rooms should be nearby, how much they are satisfied in the in the output. So is the input graph constraint is satisfied or not? And again, uh, diversity is the most difficult one, actually. it's You can actually do fairly well on the realism, say this, uh, fairly close to ours. But the diversity, uh, you kind of do worse. Uh, and compatibility uh, is also good, but diversity is the most difficult one usually. And here is the realism evaluation uh, with more information. So we ask students as well as the professional architects for a pairwise comparison. So uh, the way you look at it is you look at the bottom. So grounded truth for students. They ranked ground truth higher than, say, this method. So blue meaning this is better. So ground truth is obviously better than any other methods, both in architects or students. So our method win all the others in both architects or graduate students. Uh, the only exception was this against ground truth, like this. So uh, this was maybe more important than the technical contents I talked about. This is the research idea flow. Uh, CVPL is a contemporary art exhibition. Most ideas are actually bad. So we should you know, stop pretending all the ideas are great. Uh, you should really think about what are good ideas, bad ideas. Knowing this leads to great impact. And hope that the my idea today, Konben Pien, uh, did speak to you. Thank you very much. Our last talk is by Tom Funkhauser, who's a senior research scientist at Google and professor emeritus at Princeton University. So Tom has done some foundational work on 3D shape retrieval analysis modeling, and he's recently been working on cutting edge 3D scene understanding in computer vision. So he'll be speaking today about scene reconstruction from RGBD scans. Feel free to ask questions on Zoom and YouTube, and we'll collect them to discuss at the end of the workshop. The motivation behind this talk is to develop methods to acquire photorealistic and semantically labeled three-dimensional models of real-world indoor spaces of the type that would be useful for virtual real estate or telepresence or really any application that could use a virtual model of a real-world space. This talk will focus specifically on 3D reconstruction from RGBD. Given a set of RGBD images, our goal is to construct a three-dimensional model that has complete surface geometry, photorealistic appearances, and semantic labels. You might ask, why do we want a three-dimensional model rather than, say, a set of 2D images with labeled pixels, like the one shown on the top right? I'd argue that 3D is a natural domain for many of the tasks you'd want to do with a model of a real-world space, such as navigating through it or manipulating objects. It's also because there's a strong prior in 3D that can help reason about object relationships and shapes and affordances. 
For example, the shapes of the two night sands in this example are far more consistent in 3D than they are in the red pixels of the 2D image in the top right, which are affected by occlusions and viewpoint differences. Finally, 3D is a natural domain to integrate data from multiple observations, of course multiple images, but also audio or floor plans or data acquired from multiple visits to the same space. Of course, there are many unique challenges in 3D. We must reconstruct the surface geometry, even if it's scanned with only sparse or noisy point samples. We must estimate surface appearance so that photorealistic images can be rendered. And we must infer salient 3D relationships between objects. In this talk, I'll focus on three recent projects that address some of these issues. The first is a project called Local Implicit Grid Representations for 3D Scenes, which was presented by Max Zhang at this conference just a couple days ago. The goal of the project is to reconstruct a 3D surface from sparse 3D point samples. In this setting, the input points may be noisy or sparse, and thus simply, a f simply fitting a surface with traditional surface reconstruction methods produces over-smoothed or noisy results. One way to overcome these issues is to leverage a learned shape prior. Indeed, incredible methods have recently been proposed for learning implicit functions from data, but they've been used mostly to represent individual objects and not scenes. So the question we ask is how can we use these methods for representing large scenes? If we'd like to have a model of a house, for example, it seems impractical to have one huge global latent vector for the entire scene. Similarly, it would be inefficient to use a network capable of representing a house to evaluate an implicit function for every point to reconstruct a surface. Our approach is to decompose space into overlapping grid cells, learn a small local implicit surface function for each cell size region, and then reconstruct a scene by evaluating and composing the local implicit functions. This approach is conceptually related to other recent and concurrent work on learning local implicit functions. However, our grid-based approach has several advantages. First, it is arbitrarily scalable. Larger working volumes can be represented by adding more grid cells. Second, it's generalizable, since shapes are composed of parts from a shared shape space. Third, it can be more accurate than global implicit methods, since the encoding and decoding is performed on local regions. Finally, it's efficient, since the decoder network can be much simpler for a grid cell than for a global scene. Our training process proceeds in three steps. First, we must choose a grid size. We select one that reflects the scale of reusable parts and shapes, which is not too small, such that every shape is a nearly planar patch, and not so large that every shape is unique to one object. Second, we must generate inside-outside point samples for a training set. We train our encoder decoder from shape net models, sampling points in both directions along the surface normals from watertight shapes. Training on shape net allows our method to generalize to a wide variety of local shapes without requiring any scene data training time. Third, we train a network to evaluate local implicit functions. We built our system on the simplified version of ImNet which takes in a latent feature vector and an XYZ point sample and outputs an inside-outside indicator variable. Then at inference time, when we're given an input point cloud with oriented points for a scene, we decompose the scene into a grid and sample points in the same way we did, way we did at training time. Then we optimize the latent feature vectors for all grid cells so that a linear blend of their indicator functions best matches the inside-outside labels of the point samples. We evaluate the implicit function on a fine scale grid and run margin cubes to extract the final surface. To evaluate the properties of this method, we ran a series of experiments on both synthetic and real data. First, we tried training only on chairs from ShapeNet and then perform reconstruction of other categories, such as airplanes, sofas, tables, and cars. Because the grid size patches are reusable across categories, the model is able to generalize without any fine tuning. Second, we compare our grid-based reconstruction to the result you get from InNet for the same scene. Since InNet has a single encoder and latent vector for the entire scene, it can't capture the fine details well. Third, we compare it to traditional reconstruction methods. Here we see that Poisson's surface reconstruction produces smooth surfaces for sparse input point clouds, whereas ours fills in some details based on learned shape priors. 
which results in better quantitative reconstruction results on tests with the Matterport 3D dataset. Finally, we note that our network is 16 times smaller than the original InNet, since it must decode a simpler shape space of grid-sized parts rather than whole objects. The second project focuses on 3D surface texture optimization. It was led by Jingwei Huang during an internship at Google last summer and presented at this conference last Tuesday. The goal of the project is to estimate the 3D surface appearance. Given a 3D surface mesh and a set of posed RGBD images, the goal is to estimate a color texture representing the appearance of every surface point. Though you might think this problem is easy, simply projecting the color images from the RGBD onto the surface doesn't work. So the problem's quite hard actually due to the misalignments between surfaces and pixels from different cameras. Due to those misalignments, reconstructed textures often have blurring, seams, or ghosting artifacts, like the one shown in the top row. The typical approach to address these problems is to optimize colors in a texture atlas so that the rendered images of the textured mesh map match the observed images from the same camera viewpoint with small L2 error. Shown schematically, the free variables of the optimization are the pixels of the texture atlas, which are shown in green. The inputs are the images, camera poses, and surface mesh, which are shown in black. And the objective is to minimize the differences between the rendered and observed images. Previous work has addressed misalignment problems in this framework by optimizing parametric models that compensate for misalignments. For example, Zhao et al. led off this approach in 2014 by jointly optimizing texture and camera parameters. They and others have tried to optimize parametric models for image space warping and color balance as well. However, handcrafted parametric models cannot handle the complex misalignments that result from poor surface geometry and or other complex imaging effects. Instead, we propose a learned adversarial loss, which can be trained to be tolerant of misalignment errors. The general idea is to train a discriminator that can tell whether a rendered images is plausible misalignment of the correct texture rather than a completely incorrect texture. Our method proceeds as follows. The free variables are pixels of the te texture atlas, which are shown on the bottom left. They can be rendered differentially to form a rendered image of any real view, say A. Previous methods would then compare the rendered image to a real one from the same view with a handcrafted loss like L2. Instead, we train a discriminator to provide an adversarial loss. The input to the discriminator is either a rendering of the textured mesh, the fake class, or a reprojection of a real image from another view, the real class. By back projecting real images from other views onto the surface and then rendering them back, we create a real image with examples with misalignments that are characteristic of the data set. So then the screener learns to be tolerant of those misalignments and guides the optimization to produce textures that may be similarly misaligned, but at least they look realistic. Actually, to make the adversarial loss even better, we use a discriminator that's conditioned on the real image for the same view. As the discriminator is trained during the optimization, the overall process learns to optimize textures that look realistic without blurring, ghosting, or seams. To test the effectiveness of this approach, we did experiments with synthetic and real RGBD scans. In this synthetic example, we mapped an image onto a surface, shown on the top left, and then created an RGBD dataset of images with randomly perturbed camera extrinsics and used several recent methods to reconstruct a texture atlas from this data and compare it to ours. Please note that ours, shown on the bottom left, has at least blurring and seam artifacts. In this example, we test the effect of larger camera misalignments in comparison to the color map method of Zhao et al. Please note that our result in the bottom row stays sharp as the misalignments get quite large in the examples on the right, where the color map method results have blurring. This example shows a video of our method compared to previous work on a real RGBD scan of a real object. Note how the color map method has more blurring and 3D light has discontinuity artifacts. Similar differences can be seen in this example where our results provide the best trade-off between blurring and seams. This example shows a more challenging case where the real RGBD images are mapped onto a CAD model whose geometry differs from the 
object in the real scene. Despite the misalignment between pixels and surface geometry, our method still is able to produce sharp and seamless textures. This example shows a comparison of methods on data from scenes of ScanNet. Again, our results have less blurring and artifacts than the others. Finally, results of user study suggest that training an adversarial loss to be tolerant to misalignments is a better way to optimize textures for real RGBD data than previous methods that use handcrafted parametric models to try to fix the misalignments. Please refer to the paper for details. The third project focuses on object instance segmentation. In most work, like in the ScanNet benchmark, the task is to go from an RGBD scene reconstruction to a semantic instance segmentation, where every object is labeled with a semantic category and an instance ID. However, in many cases, it's common for an RGBD sensor to revisit the same space multiple times. And it seems helpful to use inferences made in previous visits to help ones that are being made now. For example, there's no reason that a home robot that gets powered up every morning should forget what it saw the previous day and start from scratch at understanding its environment. Rather, it should keep a persistent model and use it to make new inferences. We call this problem inductive instance segmentation. Given a model representing the history of all objects ever observed in a scene, plus a new observation, the goal is to update the model to include the new observation and to update the observation to include the instance level segmentation. In this project, we consider the challenging setting where new observations are infrequent. For example, a space may be scanned every Tuesday. Also, each scan is partial, and so difficult inference is required to predict which objects have been moved, added, or deleted between scans. Previous work has considered this kind of problem for localization, mapping, segmentation, and reconstruction in changing environments. However, no previous work has considered semantic instance segmentation for repeated RGBD scans until ICCP last year, when we and Wald et al. presented work on the problem. Our approach is to maintain an evolving temporal model comprising an object database with point clouds extracted from previous observations and rigid transformations aligning the objects to observations. For each new observation, our method makes a high recall set of object proposals by aligning objects to the newly observed point cloud. It then searches for the arrangement of objects that optimizes an objective function with terms that favor good matches of objects and point clouds, along with penalties for object intersections and large object motions. After an object arrangement has been inferred, semantic instant labels are transferred from the objects to the observation, and points from the observation are then used to augment the objects. To test how well this method works, we collected a data set with repeated RGBD scans of 13 scenes, each observed three to five times. Then we manually labeled the object instances and assigned consistent instance IDs to objects as they moved, entered, and left the scene over time. We then ran our inductive instance segmentation algorithm to predict semantic category and instance labels, as well as instance associations across time. Here's a representative example result. Note that some objects have moved significantly between time steps, but the algorithm is still able to provide the right instance segmentation for them. To evaluate the algorithm, we ran experiments and compared to the state-of-the-art methods at the time. We find that our algorithm is better able to predict semantic category and instance segmentations than previous methods, and it can better transfer instances from one scan to the next than any baseline. Here's a representative comparison. Note that our method in the second column is less likely to mix up classes because it performs holistic scoring of object arrangements over time, and thus is less prone to errors from noisier partial data. In summary, I touched on three recent problems for 3D semantic modeling from RGBD cameras, including surface reconstruction, color texture optimization, and instance segmentation. These projects are part of a broad set of related topics investigated by our group and others in the past few years. However, 3D scene understanding is a dynamic field, and there's much need for future work. There are still pressing problems at the most fundamental levels. For example, what are the best 3D representations for scene understanding? I described local implicit grids in this talk, but maybe other representations, like LDIF, could be made to work better for scenes. I'm sure there will be great advances with implicit representations of this type in the next year or two. 
And of course, there are huge problems at the higher level. So far, we tend to work on description of scenes, focusing on tasks like reconstruction and semantic segmentation. However, the most interesting questions involve physics and affordances and functions and other inferences required to interact with scenes. Those seem like good topics for future work. Thank you for listening. All right, uh, I'd like to thank all the invited speakers at this point for the great work and, and presentations and also accommodating the virtual format of, of our workshop. And I'd like to um, end with a bit of an open discussion here. Uh, so I think um, also uh, Francis and, and Chris Choi, um, uh, you're welcome to also <laughs> provide some opinions because uh, your, your work is at the top um, of these semantic uh, understanding tasks for the, the Scandinavian leaderboard. Um, and to discuss also some of these still open questions in terms of 3D understanding and what are the next big directions. Um, I think there was uh, an interesting development in terms of implicit kind of representations for um, 3D understanding, in particular, some of the work that um, Andreas Geiger was speaking about um, and how that might play a part in terms of furthering 3D understanding versus traditional um, kind of explicit representations. So what what are the thoughts about kind of um, the future directions of, of 3D representations? Does it make sense to keep moving in terms of finding these, these neural implicit representations for semantic understanding? I would say regarding the, the representation for 3D shapes, it depends a lot of what you actually want to do with the 3D reconstruction. I guess each representation has its advantages and disadvantages. So I would say it always depends on, on the task that you want to, that you try to solve. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of like semantic segmentation, semantic instance segmentation, what do you think is the right representation then? Or are <laughs> these tasks too broad? I mean, at the moment, it seems uh, for, for this kind of task, point clouds seem just fine. Of course, now the sparse convolutional networks and uh, uh, Minkowski networks, they work rather well. Um, but um, they, they also a sparse representation. So it's not, not that far away from a point cloud representation. Um, if you want to do reconstruction, if you're more interested in a, mat, a mesh, um, kind of reconstruction, then um, maybe SDF representations are more interesting or occupancy rec representation, maybe even sign distance function where you then um, can apply something like matching cubes to extract the mesh. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. right, I think uh, those are uh, all good uh, representations, but uh, I I think uh, point cloud itself is only sampling the space in a low resolution, even though the the world that we live in actually has almost continuous. I mean, if you go to a quantum level, probably it's discretized, but uh, it's almost continuous. And I think uh, the SDF or other representations require some sort of uh, low resolution greed. For example, if let's say, if we use a TSDF uh, to represent the surface, then we uh, are limited by the samples defined inside this network architecture. But uh, it seems like a uh, occupancy network or, or these uh, sorts of uh, implicit representations can go below this uh, resolution we defined. And I think, uh, and also it uh, provides additional advantage of uh, 
being differentiable as well. So I think um, uh, in terms of like con combining these uh, sparse representations, but should be convolutional to make these uh, implicit representations uh, translation invariant. Uh, so combining uh, this implicit representation into convolution would be, I think, uh, crucial for scene level representation. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of like, I think there was a relatively um, broad question in terms of reconstruction near the beginning of the, the workshop, but I think this applies also for um, semantic understanding and generally towards this representation question. It's basically like if we, if we want to be able to um, go both larger scale and finer detail, is it enough to take these current state-of-the-art approaches and, and develop some kind of course define, um, or is there something still missing in terms of being able to handle really, um, let's say, sub-centimeter scale in terms of detail and like room or building level in terms of the, the scene scale? Oh, sorry, uh, to rephrase the question, was it that do we need to explore uh, additional representations to go beyond uh, what, what we've been using? Uh, am I capturing, uh, rephrasing your question, right? Yeah, something like this. Okay. Yeah, I think um, currently to go below um, the uh, sub, yeah, sub centimeter uh, resolution, it seems like the, the data set currently uh, provides some challenge. For example, the point cloud that we use is actually uh, generated uh, uh, from meshes. And then the, these meshes uh, seem to be generated using uh, TSDF integration, which limits the resolution that we can use for perception. But I think uh, it uh, it's combined with um, the sensory uh, noise at this level. So uh, what uh, Thomas Funkhauser uh, showed uh, in the, his talk to combine this uh, neural network representations with adversarial optimization uh, would probably allow us to go beyond this uh, sensory noise and allow us to capture the scene uh, at higher resolution uh, than the the sensors provides, I think. Mm -hmm. Um. Also, if anybody else has um, any questions, feel free to chime in or or add it to the chat. So can I can I make a comment? Can I add a comment? Um. When we talk about re uh, representations, I think some of the most interesting stuff that's happened in the last six months is this uh, idea that you can put some of your representation for individual instances in the network weights. So like NERF or, or things like that, um, you know, where you, you actually train the network for this example and your shape representation isn't just the latent code or, you know, I guess there's explicit, there's latent code and there's network weights. And those things combine to make a shape. And I think it's an interesting thing to think about where, how to combine all three, not just how do you learn the latent code, things like that. Anyway, so I think there's a, a richer space of investigation that we haven't really fully fleshed out yet. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask a question too. <laughs> so I mean, I mean we have different ways of doing convolutional operators, right? We can do it densely. We can do sparse cons. We can probably do it somewhat on the surface in geodesics or so. Um, I mean, I, I'm personally considering the sparse cons not a point-based representation, right? Because they still define a virtual voxel grid. Like I mean, you're mapping a 3D coordinate to discrete set of voxels by setting a resolution and so on. 
So, I mean, that's more or less like the representation that the network is using. But at the same time, you're going to have um, a representation like sign distance fields and stuff like that. What's the, the combination of these two, right? Like, do you want to use sign distance field as input to sparse cons? Um, how do you add color eventually, right? What's, what's the future roadmap there? Well, uh, from, uh, I think th this is just an idea, but uh, from what Andre Geiger's uh, proposed, um, the, the occupancy, convolution occupancy network, they just, uh, it just uh, take, e at, at, at voxel level, it takes a set of points as an input uh, with the global pooling. I think uh, this uh, s combines this uh, pros of the both words in that, in the representation level, we are actually using a dense, uh, sorry, uh, sparse voxel grids, which uh, convolution operators are really good at. But uh, at the input and the output layers, uh, we are using continuous representations uh, in that, in a form of a point net in the uh, voxel level in the input side, and then output level in the uh, forms of occupancy uh, network uh, to, to represent a continuous surface in a differentiable way. Uh, so I think uh, this uh, seems to be a very um, a good combination of uh, pros of both representations. Any, any other thoughts? I can have a few comments to um, to the implicit representations. I mean, one thing what is still different from generative tasks where we see a lot of success right now, like NERF is a good example. These papers, what they do is they're trying to they don't try to do any learning, right? They're trying to do interpolation between a very dense set of data points, um, overfitted to a specific scene. The question is, can we leverage these kind of things for discriminative tasks, right? That's still a, it's still not so clear, right? I mean, at the moment, like the implicit neural representations, they all kind of they're trying to figure out what is the best way to get a good encoding. It's more like a, a signal processing question. There's been a actually two papers in the last two days that define like either sinoids or, or Fourier, um, uh, Fourier features um, in order to encode, uh, to, to encode the signal better. Do we see this kind of stuff for discriminative tasks too? Is that happening that we can actually use that for learning or is that just going to be some sort of better representation and for a single scene? Anyone should I call Tom? You have to say something. You're a senior guy here. I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, I don't understand. So the, the the two papers that came out, I guess today or whatever, no. um, they, they're just proposing uh, sinusoidal or you know or, or or some kind of thing instead of ReLU, uh, right? I mean, and so that's that sounds like a good idea, and the, the results are kind of amazing. If you haven't seen these papers, what are they called? One's by Vincent Sitzman mm -hmm. and one's by, is it by John Barron or the 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 other one, the 4A one? That's the same, that's the anyway. team pretty much, yeah. Well, I think they're different papers. I know, um, but what I'm saying is like the second paper you mentioned, that was the same authors as, as the NERF papers. Oh, I see, yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, anyway, um, yeah, and Vincent's results are just absolutely amazing. Um, uh, but I, th I don't understand why that makes it only generative and not discriminative or something like that. If you had an ARC net where it wasn't like the network weights were frozen at training time from the ARC net, but instead they were fit, find, you know, fit to this particular example, that is a representation of this example. And I don't care whether the, it has a ReLU or some other kind of layer there for the nonlinearity. I'm, I'm not sure I understood your, your, your question. Well, my question is it. like these papers, what they do is they basically, these sinusoidal activations, their purpose is to get a better, activa a, a better positional encoding basically, right? This is about give me end data, try to get the most efficient representation. This is not for any extrapolation or channelization. Right, they, they don't learn anything in a sense, right? They just Overfit right. to one scene or one image yeah. and try to encode this image in the best way. Right. But the question is still, do we get features that are generalizable for discriminative tasks there? 
that one is not so clear to me yet because I mean, people have tried similar activation function for discriminant tasks and it didn't really work so well. But, but here, like, um, it's not about that, right? It's about the positional encoding, like having a data point, how is that represented in a, in a neural embedding? Fair. Um, I don't, I agree that there's not, we don't know yet whether these representations that uh, overfit the network weights to examples can can learn network weights that generalize that way. I agree with that. It seems very promising though. Any other thoughts? I don't want to, by the way, I think it's very exciting, uh, a very exciting direction. So I'm trying to phrase it a bit in a more provocative sense. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, that's a very, uh, I only skimmed through the papers and I think the results are fantastic, but uh, uh, let's let's think of uh, how we do convolution. Uh, so for instance, uh, if we do the uh, Fourier decomposition of an image and then do the convolution or any learning operations on the Fourier uh, frequency domain, it incurs a lot of uh, computational overhead. Uh, so we have to go from primal to dual and then the back and forth multiple times to actually do the uh, forward pass. So I think uh, in in that sense, uh, yeah, some um, compression methods like uh, this, uh, yeah, decompo decomposing the scene or the images into uh, mm -hmm. coefficients of some basis are really good at compression. But when the neural networks process these, uh, um, uh, representations, I think uh, neural networks would also have difficulty un understanding this, uh, uh, probably would have uh, difficulty understanding this uh, worse than the, the, the explicit representations. So in terms of like computation and then the difficulty of learning, I think um, uh, it, it might pose some challenges. Okay, I got, I got another topic maybe to ask. So what do you guys think and what's the best way to combine color and geometric signal for scene understanding tasks? That's still a pretty interesting question, right? I mean, we often have these things of like, well, do we want to use RGB images rather and do some stuff there, then back project to 3D? Um, can we do it directly in 3D? Like what's, like, what's the future there? I guess everybody wants to know. <laughs> Maybe not, not necessarily so many suggestions. I mean, there's probably something to be said that it seems like um, operating on on higher resolutions is still producing better results, both for geometry as well as for color. And I guess the question is also how to explain this, what is like the, the right kind of correlation. Um, and also at some point there is a, a limit to the geometric resolution typically with respect to the color resolution. And potentially, you know, how much can you get out of having just nicer data than something that comes out of like a very commodity level phone. So if you have well calibrated high resolution DSLR images, then it's uh, probably easier to get the right alignment and the um, more consistent views across a, an object or a scene. That answer your question, Matthias? Not really, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I did not expect the, an answer that fully answers it. <laughs> there might also be something to be said for having an implicit representation that is maybe capable of having higher resolution color as well. I, I agree with the point that uh, images definitely still have a much higher resolution than the, the reconstructions that we have at the moment. So there, there might definitely be more information in there. 
Um, what I found not also interesting is now uh, Tom's one of his last slides where he um, looked at potentially interesting future directions. We go, um, what, what actually are we going to do with those um, still very basic scene understanding uh, things that we're doing? I mean, semantic segmentation, instance segmentation, it's still rather low level vision. So, what, what do you think is an, an interesting? Um, yeah, applications of, of those um, scene understanding, low, low vision level things that we have at the moment. For well, example- Well, I can comment I, on, okay, go ahead. Uh, one, one thing that I believe would be interesting is like um, to think at a, at a higher level now, how do these individual objects that we identified or detected, how do they interact like, um, for example, chairs that are positioned around a table or chairs in front of a desk, they, they form some kind of semantic group, if you want. Um, well, yeah, maybe, maybe you can continue from there. Yeah, that seems like a higher level, you know, thing is object relationships. But um, I mean, I just have a, a high level comment, which is uh, the scan that challenges is one particular kind of application where you scan a scene for the purpose of, of understanding it later. Uh, so that might be good for mapping a site or you know, seeing, I don't know, uh, understanding a space. But there are most applications that require 3D scene understanding uh, are real-time applications like robotics or self-driving cars or AR, VR, where you're making decisions as you go. Um, and you're inter you, you have the opportunity of changing your viewpoint interactively and you're interacting with a scene. And so those kinds of applications need to understand a lot more about interaction with the scene than they do about just labeling everything. Uh, it's not that useful to say, this is a chair if you don't really know how to sit down in it or, or yeah, I'm not sure what the right example is there, but uh, I think there's a lot of applications where we're, we're, we're not really solving the task that's gonna necessarily be the thing they need. Yeah, I guess it's probably still, uh, th there's no clear problem formulation yet for, for such higher level tasks. Maybe we need a, a higher level scanner data set benchmark for that. Yeah, I mean, I, the, what's the next data set is an interesting question. I, I mean, I, I would be curious about the people who were the winners of the challenge of what they think about what's what's the headroom possible on the ScanNet data set from here forward. Um, like in the end, when people stop working on ScanNet, what I, I mean, I owe you are they going to be getting? And is it already about there now? Because the labels aren't perfect, and you know the, some of the classes are ambiguous, and so even at, what would a person get on this data set is a is an interesting thing. And then what should the next data set be? Maybe Angie has a comment about what what, they, what she thinks the headroom is. Well, there's definitely something to be said in terms of what's the max performance. On, on this data set, um, given that there are some noticeable biases in terms of object distribution and, and these kinds of things. Um, it seems like the performance um, on the benchmark still gets better. <laughs> so there might be a bit of headway still, but it's definitely slowed in terms of the improvements from what I've seen. So mm -hmm. in terms of I mean, I think what would make sense in terms of interesting data, I think there's a lot of different like things we can um, potentially represent, but all of them require a lot more expensive annotation than something like semantic instances. If you want to, um, I mean, like a, something that ScanNet doesn't represent that is pretty unrealistic of the real world is just the lack of, of dynamics um, of, of objects moving, of people moving, of interactions and these kinds of things. 
Uh, and maybe there's also a, a degree to which, you know, human tracking um, can be leveraged along with reconstruction in order to get a bit more insight into these, these directions. So what do you what do you guys think actually you were working more recently on the on the benchmark in terms of potential for headway i mean i th do think that what matthias was mentioning in terms about combining geometry and color there's still probably potential there in terms of um strict improvements i mean one thing i could say like i mean the the, the problem what i'm not very happy with is with color the thing that works the best is to exploit pre-trained 2D networks on, you know, big ImageNet architectures like ResNet or whatever, right? Um, these ones just give you the best features because they have the best pre-training information. They're pretty big. You can extract these features, back project them in whatever way to 3D and then combine them with 3D information. Um, but I think we're kind of in a local minima there because the 2D networks are so well engineered. This is the best way to use the color features. Um, so, I don't know, like using color features as part of some sort of 3D representation is still something that is very difficult, I think. Um, but it might be in a local minimum. It might be very hard to get out of this one. And I think it might be difficult to find a solution there. Um, I mean, like Jingwei had a paper, right, where you do like tension, or this tension convolution paper was the first one actually. And then Jingwei had a paper basically in texture space and geodesics uh, exploding that. Um, it didn't work as well as just doing the simpler way. <laughs> So that I think is a bit is a bit sad in a sense. Um, so it would have been nice to like directly exploit the three D context with the color directly. Um, Did people try to use the? I mean, it seems now that the sparse convolution Minkowski kind of networks that they work really well on the geometry. But I'm not sure if people actually tried to combine these kind of networks with uh, color information, right? Uh, I'm, I'm thinking now of the, of whose paper, um, the mm -hmm. 3D SIG, right? They combine mm -hmm. 2D and 3D information. Maybe I'm thinking now from an engineering perspective, right? If you take the best 2D network and the best 3D network and then try to combine those and see how much you can push, uh, how much you can push the scores here. I mean, if you ask me to get the best performance right now, you take the latest, probably an alias Minkowski architecture. Um, but as input, you're going to use normal information. As a separate feature, you're going to use um, the back projected colors with the dense net, like a very strong 2D network. Um, and you, you're going to use a sign distance field probably with a very short truncation on instead of just using points. So use the location plus the sign distance field and probably a gradient, which gives, is given by the normal basically, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so basically you're asking for a, a pre-computed feature on the geometry that you could even do at a higher resolution that you can feed in, um, feeding that one in, combining it with the color. And I, I would argue this gives you the, would give you the best result. It probably would give you another few percent. Mm -hmm. so, so there's another thing that I noticed now specifically from the, the OCUSEC uh, paper, they pushed the score quite a bit on both the semantic and the instance uh, semantic segmentation uh, tasks. And one thing that they also do a bit similar to my 3D MPA method is that they have these super voxels. Uh, so they split, first split the scenes into um, geometrically connected parts, if you want. Um, one interesting thing uh, people told me is that the super voxelization that they are using is actually the same one that was used to create the, the scanner benchmark. Um, do you think we are already um, in, a, in, a, in a phase where we overfit on the, on the scanner benchmark? If we start using the same um, methods in the same super voxelization methods in, in, in the algorithms that we evaluate that are used to actually annot create the annotations in the data set? Um, I think so. Um, you can also see it in the, from a different perspective. Um, if you're looking not just at the final accuracies, right, or the final average I use, if you're looking at the per class I use, you see some classes do pretty well and other classes do pretty bad. 
and, and there's obviously a reason for it. It depends like how much training data you have and so on. Mm. Um, like things like pictures is a pretty difficult thing because the geometric features are probably terrible. No, I, but I don't, I think it's subtler than that. And it relates to the previous comment, which is that when ScanNet was labeled, Angie would be a great person to comment on this. Uh, there were su super segments or whatever you call them, super pixel, you know, mesh versions of that, that you had to choose whether it was picture or wall. And if those boundaries weren't in the right place, then you had to introduce an error one way or the other. And so if you had an algorithm that did exactly the same super pixels in meshes, then you would have the same choice. Whereas any other algorithm might actually correctly label the, the edge of the picture in exactly the right place, and actually the, the score would be bad. So like, based on my experience labeling things with, with a tool that was used to, to, to label ScanNet, you often had the choice of this, this super pixel actually spans a boundary, what do I do? Yeah, towards yeah. this, sorry. I'll go ahead. I mean, if, if it's a question, does it overfit to, to the scan net? Yeah, there's definitely some overfitting by using the, the same primitive. Um, the labels in scan net largely tried to avoid having any annotation where there was a strong conflict like, you know, if the edge of a picture in a wall is not quite perfect, then the edge won't be perfect. But if the, like, um, there's no way to distinguish a whiteboard in a wall, then there's often just no annotation in this location at all. So that trying to avoid some of this um, particular bias in the data annotation, but it's, it's not a 100% avoidable. Yeah, but like, for example, I think that the reason that the picture class does so poorly on ScanNet, you know, the, the, the top methods do so poorly, and again, people who submitted to the challenge would have a better idea than I, uh, is largely about the, the ground truth, not just the fact that we don't have colors integrated well, is that there's a lot of pictures that aren't labeled because they aren't, weren't really so evident. And but I, think, but I think it's based on the data. Boundaries aren't quite right. What's that? I, I think it's, I, I agree what you're saying, but I think the result of why you're having this choice sometimes labeling is a picture is not is because this is based on a geometric over segmentation right and sometimes the resolution of the of the sensor being used is not high enough to distinguish it right if i had perfect edge segmentation there in the, in the over segmentation right i wouldn't have that issue i would have a perfect i would have a perfect segment around the frame the people who submitted, do they feel like their results on the picture class are as good as the ground truth, but are, are not getting the full 100% credit for it? Or do, do they think that they're not doing well in the picture class compared to what they should be doing? So what I can tell from my experience, uh, this is not just my, my, my own opinion. Um, sometimes it feels like, um, if you look, even if you, even if you look at the ground truth on the validation set, um, it feels like a lot of images are not annotated. Maybe because the the super voxelization method just um, clustered the whole wall as one, and there was not even the option not to label it. I don't know, but I, I think that are I think the labels the, could could be better. Um, Sometimes uh, th there is one example even where a shower curtain is labeled as a, as a regular curtain. Um, I, I think there's, uh, th there are uh, quite uh, some obvious errors in the annotations. And uh, I mean, I, I understand it's, it's very hard to do this kind of annotations, but um, th they, are, they are there. And obviously this will also confuse uh, an algorithm if you try to train it. I mean, maybe getting back to the discussion, like I think for, especially for instance segmentation, we've seen tremendous progress in the last year, right? I mean, the original, the first things, like, I mean, there's the two things, right? You can do top down and bottom up, right? Do you do anchor based or do you do some sort of, I don't know, metric learning and then you accumulate cluster of stuff later on. Um, it turns out the, the second part, 
works much easier in, in 3D, right? Because you have metric, you have metric units, you know how far things are away. So basically doing some clustering is inherently easier than doing an image. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that number could go still up quite a bit. Like, especially if you're looking at the last half year, right? This went up by, by quite a lot, actually. That is correct. But I guess this is also um, because we have much stronger we are backbones now. The sparse conf nets uh, were also pushing the instant segmentation quite a bit. True, I agree because, um, because it's both right. We have better mechanisms for for the clustering, but we also have we have better backbones, as you say. In a way, I I like the point group approach because if you if you look at it, what they do is actually quite. Um, I don't want to say simple in a bad way, but. Uh, I, I think it is um, the the clustering. One of the clusterings that they do is pretty much just clustering the the predictions from the sparse convolutional network. And I think if you look at their paper with that alone, they already get a a quite high score. I think in the in the fifties. And then um, the other clustering that they do is on the on the predicted centers. I I would argue that this is it's it's very elegant, but it's still um, simple. Um, so, so I guess there's uh, from that perspective, there's maybe you can do even something more elaborated to to push it even further. This course. Uh, would you take a question from the audience as well? Yes. yes. Please. <laughs> uh, just picking up on the uh, the fact, okay, of a data set, uh, the the a uh, lots of effort we goes into to annotating it, and then maybe having category like a picture, which probably had a a lower frequency of occurrence. So I mean, obviously, scan that. You know, it's it's a, it's a great data, and you know there are follow-ups like Matterport, 3D, and etc. But we are still talking about uh, largely home and office environments. So so once people want to start using results of these methods in you know retail spaces, or if you want to make it harder industrial spaces, uh, then it's going to be of case that. It's going to be very hard to assemble same body of, of training data, or which is let's say present in a in a scanner for for lots of you know, explosion of other categories people are going to be uh, interested in. Uh, so I, I'm just curious in, in terms of like general opinions. Uh, you know, if people are kind of starting to look and think how to how to start achieving same scores using much less data, you know, along the lines of the, the few shot learning or self-supervised learning, which is, you know, getting quite a lot of traction in the in image space. Sorry, I didn't want to kill the discussion. Well, I think that uh, self-supervised learning and semi-supervised learning and stuff like that is definitely very useful and powerful, and we should definitely be doing it. Uh, I think we're at the point now, though, where there's just very little data at all, labeled or not. And, and so uh, it would be nice to have access to just more data so that we could even do projects like that. Um, in the self-driving car space, they're starting to become fairly large data sets. And maybe with as 3D scanners like driven by, I don't know. Anyway, we're just in the point right now where we don't really have a ton of data labeled or not.
Yeah, I, I agree on that point. I think self-supervised approaches are becoming more popular, but we also are still extremely limited in the amount of 3D data that we have available of um, you know, real world environments or even in synthetic environments. So <laughs> there's still something to be said about the ability to develop more sophisticated approaches um, on a larger amount of data uh, before maybe fully going over towards um, you know, a few shot approaches, which are definitely still valuable. But um, you know, the the size of, for instance, ScanNet and Matterport is still dwarfed by the size of, of image data sets for similar kinds of tasks. So I, I have a question to Angel, Manolis, uh, and Matthias on that. Uh, I think uh, <clears throat> Thomas mentioned that what would be the next data set, next scan net. And it seems that uh, Manolis and Angel has, has been working, have been working on uh, creating this interactive data set for retrieval, navigation, Etc. Uh, do you think that uh, those would be the next data set, the, the interactive, uh, virtual interactive data sets, could be the next scan net? Or do you think uh, other forms of uh, challenges uh, would be necessary to make this uh, work? Um, so, I mean, I mean, obviously you can do a lot, lot of stuff with simulation, right? There will be more stuff coming up, but simulation is in a sense, like it's particularly useful because it's so difficult to get the real world data, right? If you have a virtual 3D environment, you can do whatever you want with it and you can render from different viewpoints, you can change lighting, you can move objects around and stuff like that. So that's why, you know, like Manolis' Habitat and so on, this is why this became very, very successful actually. And it will, it will be continuing successful. Um, I think at the same time, Domain adaptation and transfer learning is still a big challenge. Like training only on synthetic data will be a challenge to get this to work on real data. Um, we're not quite there yet. Um, I think on the high level, dynamics is the big thing. Dynamics and interaction is the big thing that is missing in, in all of this right now, right? Um, we don't have a human in there. We don't have interaction with the environment. Objects are currently still static. Like nothing is being moved around. Um, so the whole temporal component, I think, is a big missing piece. And ultimately, the question is, what is the right, what is the application, what we want to do with it, right? And obviously, I mean, I think there's two main applications we're thinking. One is robotics, right? You have a robot that wants to understand the environment. And the other one is maybe like AR, VR scenarios where you also, you know, want to recognize objects, have like a virtual assistant and doing something with the environment. So, and for all of these, for, for both of these applications, I think you need to have some dynamics and you want to have some interaction. Um, so we've been working a little bit on, on both ends um, in terms of dynamics. So we, we're trying to do non-richards, right? We have this deep deformed data set is something we had at CVPR this year. Um, that's for single objects though. Like it's not, not a full scene yet. Um, but that's a very, very hard task to get just the non-richard reconstruction right in this case. It's not even about the semantics yet. We're just trying to do non-richard reconstruction. Um, so this is why it's so difficult to create these data sets where we have non rich elements like cloth clothes um, that is lying around like towels, couches are being moved and stuff like that. But that's very difficult, generally speaking. Um, you also gonna, like Johanna Wald at TUM, she, she had an oral at ICCV last year where she rescanned data sets multiple times. And um, I think one of Tom's students, Maciej Halpert, he, has, he had also data sets similar to that. They also rescanned basically data sets a couple, uh, scenes a couple of times. Um, and that is also interesting, but it's it's very sparsely temporally sampled. There's not a lot of stuff going on because it's so difficult to get the data there. So the reconstruction is not quite there yet to create these dynamic data sets. Um, but it would be incredibly important for the understanding. Um, so we will see probably a lot of learning on virtual data sets just because of the lack of available real data. But I think in the next few years, they, they have to there has to be some efforts being made to address these specific challenges, I think. I think Manolis might have been saying something or wanted to say something. I'm not sure. Oh, sorry. Yep. 
That's okay. I think Matthias actually articulated it pretty well in the chat. We can barely hear you. Can you get closer to your microphone? Is it better now? No. Not really. Uh, uh, how, how about now? Much better. Yes. Okay. There we go. Uh, so I, I think Matthias articulated pretty well the challenges that I was going to bring up, uh, you know, the, the doing dynamic reconstruction, getting some sort of uh, data of how all the various objects that exist in scenes can be interacted with. Uh, there's big, big challenges there. Uh, and in some sense, all these, you know, efforts that emerge now with simulation, uh, they are, they can exist because of data such as ScanNet and Matterport and so forth. They, they're taking that as a substrate. And until we resolve these challenges of acquiring interactive environments and having data that allows us to simulate dynamics, uh, there's th that bottleneck will exist. So the, the challenges that Matthias described are very real. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, as a stopgap measure, people, I believe, will be um, largely employing some sort of synthetic data, domain randomization, just introducing variations that are perhaps not captured from the real world, but sufficient to explore these interesting directions, while uh, others work on acquiring the real data. Maybe one comment. I mean, maybe maybe the solution is we get the domain adaptation. We use the static part, right, to get that working. But then we can also use dynamics to do the domain transfer later on. Um, but it, it's still challenging, obviously. I mean, if you're looking at the numbers of domain adaptation, I guess for depth you have a better chance. But for the RGB, it's still like we're nowhere near close. I mean, you know, actually, you know, it's like how how well does it work when you train something purely on habitat without any fine tuning and try to test on real world scenes? depends on the sensory input. So uh, with depth-based sensing, there are some success stories, but uh, when we're talking about just uh, uh, camera-based input in the real world, things are very far. I think that's maybe a, a interesting note to conclude on in terms of dynamics, interactions, domain adaptation. Lots of big questions, I think, nonetheless. Um, so thanks again uh, to all of the um, invited speakers uh, and everybody who's stuck around um, to the end. And uh, yeah, take care. Thank you for organizing. Thank you. See you guys. Uh, thank Thanks you. for joining. Thanks. Bye -bye. Thank you. Great line.